The Silas Kane Scrolls, Authors and Dragons Origins, Book 2. Written by Rick Gualtieri, Authors and Dragons. Narrated by Matt Haynes. Dead End Jobs Michael Adelberg stepped into the dusty office at the ass end of the museum, located far from the public exhibits. Here was where the shit work took place. Cleaning, cataloging, and translating barely legible works of antiquity, all for one purpose, being promoted to a better position. How goes the translation? Associate archaeologist Trevor Barrington looked up, bleary-eyed from his desk, and nodded a greeting. The scrolls displayed on his monitor had actually been discovered years earlier, locked away in a remote cave. But due to layers of bureaucratic bullshit, they'd only recently been catalogued. A cursory analysis, though, had revealed promising clues as to their contents, enough to make the two junior researchers nearly piss themselves with anticipation. Myths and legends from the ancient world were common, but full stories were rare. Discovering a new Beowulf was the archaeological equivalent of striking the mother load. Reputations were built on such finds. Trevor stretched and rubbed his eyes. I thought we were on to something, but now I'm not so sure. You gotta be shitting me. I thought it was... It's a story, all right. I'm just not sure it's epic. Here, I'll show you. Trevor pointed to the weathered parchment pictured on his screen. Mark the words of Theoden, Grimstrike, Mortal, and mark them well. Sounds like it's starting off pretty good. That's what I thought, too. Hold your horses. He read some more. I write this account as a warning to you of a warrior most terrible. Mike took a seat. All right, that's kind of badass. The most fucking awful paladin I have ever had the displeasure of knowing. Oh. Trevor nodded. Yeah, kind of goes downhill from there. Sounds like this Theoden guy was three sheets to the wind when he wrote this. I mean, hell, he claims to be a demigod of Tuareg. Who? Some deity he keeps mentioning over and over again like a broken record. Never heard of him. Mike leaned in for a closer look. Oh, hold on. I see the problem. You're reading it wrong. Look there. I think it actually says Tor... Trevor rounded on the other scientist. Who are you, my fucking copy editor? Do you want to sit here for the next week retranslating this shit? Be my guest. Mike backed away, hands up in a placating manner. Relax, dude. Tuareg it is. No need to get your panties in a bunch. It's not like I'm going to copyright this stupid thing. Sorry, I get a little punchy when I'm tired. It's cool, bro. Just maybe switch to, you know, decaf. At the other man's glare, Mike was quick to add, So, what else does it say? It is only by the grace of eight cups of ale sitting in my gut that I can stomach writing this story. But even besotted to shit... I can still hear it all clear as day. I can see him. A curse upon the name Silas Cain. Fuck him and his very existence, I say. But save the last few drops for those who filled his head with lies and unleashed him upon an unsuspecting world. May a thousand bloated camels forever piss on their graves. Sadly... I, too, must drink deep of that yellow downpour. Me, the god's damned fool who thought he could sway this madman from his path. Much of the blame lies on my head, and for that I am forever cursed. Know my name, Theoden Grimstrike, and understand that I am nothing more than dirt, filth, a pile of shit beneath the scabbed feet of leprous beggars. But it wasn't always so. Once I was exalted among the mighty dwarven clans. For eons I sat at the right hand of the great god Tuareg, the mighty hammerer. He tasked me with dispensing earthly justice wherever it was needed while he stoked the fires of the great kiln. 
the mighty temple raised to him by his most fervent and beloved followers. The peak of Stormstrike, home of the kiln and tallest mountain within the band of steel, rang constantly with the sound of blacksmiths forging weapons and armor for the dwarven kings. But that was nothing compared to the booming thunder of my lord, constantly swirling around the mountain, and serving as both protection to those within it, as well as a warning to the myriad enemies seeking to claim it. But you are not here to listen to tales of greatness, or the adventures of the kiln's many heroes, nor do I care to tell it. Innumerable are their exploits, monsters slain, maidens rescued, the kingdoms of tyrants overthrown. Their deeds serve to inspire others to greatness. This, however, is a story of madness, murder, and the stupidity that caused it all. You see, weapons were not all that was forged within the great kiln. Despite my lord's love of his people, and the wisdom he shared with them, a darkness began to fester, giving birth to those who sought to twist Tuareg's words to match their own vile ambitions. Eventually the stain of this lunatic fringe was noticed, spreading like a fungus, and they were exiled, never to return. The outcasts marched to the east, eventually settling in a path of hills bordering lands claimed by the Longlegs, or humans, as they liked to call themselves. A stupid name, but fitting for such a ridiculous race. Here they founded a temple, which they called the Shrine of the Shattered Hammer, a stronghold from which to preach their crazed beliefs to any who would listen. Tuareg ordered me to keep watch on the shrine from afar. But it was a task I did not undertake with much seriousness. If anything, it was hard not to be flattered at their unerring belief that our Lord was the God above all others, and that His worship and His alone was to be taught. Hell, for a time it seemed no more than harmless zealotry. Humans had no interest in the word of Tuareg and orc raiders were far more likely to eat a dwarf than talk to one. It was hard for the clerics of the shrine to spread their disease when everyone else was seemingly immune. Due to a lack of willing converts lining up at their gates, the exiled dwarves mostly kept to themselves. They only ventured forth when the need for drinking and whoring became too great for the elders to deny. Hardly transgressions worth smiting them over or so I thought at the time. It was during one such pilgrimage that Coin Copperbeard, abbot of the shrine, heard the sound of battle calling to him. Bored from their long trek, he and his followers decided to investigate, spying a family of long legs being waylaid by bandits. Simple farmers on the way to market, they stood no chance against their armed foes. But Coin didn't give so much as a single shit. What concern was it to him if humans killed other humans? The amusement of watching the slaughter was short-lived, and they were about to turn away when they heard one of the thieves mockingly offer thanks to the goddess, Olynthia, venerating her with the good fortune of meeting their victims when they did. It was not so much their tone or their intent that swayed the dwarves as hearing praise being given to any other than Tuareg. So poisoned were they by their own twisted dogma that they screamed out my lord's name and charged into the fray, looking to silence the heretic's tongues. Soon the forest ground was sticky with human blood and covered with a veritable feast for the forest's many scavengers. As they were dispatching the last of the bandits, one of the clerics heard the faint sound of laughter coming from the wreckage of the victim's wagon. There he discovered the lone survivor of the massacre, a human infant giggling and happily playing with his mother's lopped-off head. The dwarf, neither without mercy nor immune to being weirded the fuck out, 
raised his hammer high so as to give the child a quick death. But, in a moment before the boy's head could be ground into oatmeal, Coin stayed his underling's hand. He'd been struck by inspiration. What if they had a human champion to help spread the word? A true believer sent out among the longlegs to tirelessly preach the word of Tuareg. Humans mostly dismissed dwarves, due to their short stature and bearded womenfolk, but they might not be so quick to ignore one of their own. He ordered the child to be spared, gathered him up in his arms, and telling his followers of his plan. This boy had a glorious destiny before him. He would be the shrine's hope, their zealot, their weapon. Years passed, twenty in all, a blink of the eye for long-lived people such as dwarves, but more than enough time to ripen the foul fruit they'd planted in the boy's head, nurtured by the tainted mulch of their vile ideals. The child, not overly burdened with natural intelligence, was the perfect receptacle for their crazed dogma. He soaked up their endless sermons as if he were a sponge. Christened Silas Cain, for little more reason than the abbot thought it might sound cool to the other humans, he was taught to believe his parents were once mighty warriors of Tuareg. They had fought many battles in his name, slayed numerous wicked beasts, and earned the enmity of countless non-believers. So fierce were they in their faith that, upon their deaths, the heretical kings of men ordered their names stricken from the histories, and for none to ever mention them again. Quite the convenient story, but one the doll sought of a boy never questioned. Silas was continually reminded of their fictional sacrifice, and his inability to live up to their reputation. The dwarves constantly punished him as a reminder that Tuareg's love was forever outside his grasp, yet something he should never stop striving for. In time, he learned their ways and grew strong. The hours spent studying scripture no longer tired him. They reaffirmed his beliefs. The beatings no longer hurt. They invigorated him and made him beg for more. Soon enough, the disciples of the shattered hammer got their wish. Silas became the weapon they'd hoped for. What they didn't realize, though, was that even the dullest blade must still be handled with care, lest it cut the hand that wields it. Heretical Hairs Hurry up and put that gear down, Silas. Tuareg is disgusted by your laziness. Thank you, Abbot, Silas replied eagerly carefully stacking the gear of the dwarves who'd come along on this pilgrimage. He muttered to himself under his breath as he worked, reciting his favorite tracks from the one true book of Tuareg, revised edition, of course, and promising to whip himself extra hard that night for his pathetic inability to work faster. I shook my head sadly as I watched all of this from above, floating invisibly over the encampment, no more detectable than a gust of wind through the trees. For years I'd spied upon the shrine, always listening, but never interfering. I'd witnessed countless hours of torture inflicted upon the human lad, but had never once acted, for that was my mission, watch and observe, but do nothing unless absolutely necessary. This was Silas's first outing since being taken in as a baby. Abbot Coyne and his elders planned to use this pilgrimage as a test run for the boy, hoping to meet some long legs on the road and see how well his lessons held sway in the face of others of his kind. So far, all they'd done was use their eager pupil as little more than a pack mule, loading him down with more gear than he could carry, while they trekked ahead free of their burdens, then complaining when he couldn't keep up. Though my task was to observe, nothing more. I had begun to question my station in recent years. I felt a great deal of pity for Silas, 
for though he remained stoic in the face of the beatings, brandings, burnings, dunkings, freezings, and other assorted horrors of his training, little by little my own heart had begun to break for him. As it was, I found myself intrigued when first hearing of this journey, though it was blasphemous to even think of disobeying my master. I considered doing just that. Perhaps there would come a chance to reach out to the boy, to open his eyes and show him all that he held true was a lie. That, though Torig was indeed great, he did not embody the megalomaniacal ideals that Silas's masters taught. Coyne walked over and kicked Silas in the backside as he was setting up the party's bedrolls, knocking him face first into the grass. Get a fire started, stupid boy, and set a pot of water to boil. Tuareg commands it. Silas pulled his scarred face from the dirt and smiled broadly up at his teacher. Shall I scorch my genitals with it? If there's anything left when we're finished, feel free. But for now, it's so Gorlem can prepare our dinner. Oh, I do love Master Gorlem's cooking. Coin raised an eyebrow at the young warrior's words but not as much as I loved Tuareg. That seemed to satisfy the aged abbot. He nodded his grey-bearded head once, and then walked away to confer in hushed voices with the others. I took the opportunity to swoop lower so as to eavesdrop on them. We should take the boy with us, one of the dwarves said. Brimstoke is only a few miles to the west. If he can convert those drunken cunts to our ways, he can convert anyone. Coin shook his head. He's not ready. What do you say, Gutspear? The heavily armed dwarven warrior nodded. Agreed. Not to mention we won't be able to have any fun while he's around. That elicited a chorus of agreement from the group. So, what do we do? Have him stand guard outside the town? Tell him to patrol the woods for heretics? Too risky, Coin said. What if he gets curious as to what we're up to? No, I don't want him going near Brimstoke. At least not yet. Afraid they'll ruin him? Coin let out a laugh and gave the other dwarf a shove. Hardly. More afraid that he'll burn it to the ground, leaving our throats parched and our pricks dry. Again, the dwarves raised their voices just enough to agree, as Silas continued to work on the other side of the encampment. Gutspear folded his muscled arms across his chest. So, are you saying we should stay away, then? Pity. It's been far too long since I've had a chance to dip my javelin. You mean your toothpick? The party's cook, Gorlim, joked, causing the rest to burst into muffled laughter. Not a chance, Coin said at last. I'll be damned before I make this journey both sober and unfucked. What do you propose, Abbot? Simple. We bring the festivities to us. How so? Gutspear asked. You and Voigt head to Brimstoke. Bring back a barrel of rum, a side of pork, and enough whores to go around. That means at least two for me. But what about Silas? Fuck that. No whores for the boy. I meant I'll handle him, Corn replied to the warrior. Don't worry. I'll make sure he's kept busy. Praise Tuareg! This time they didn't keep their voices low, echoing Coin's cry loud enough that Silas joined them, despite having no clue as to what he was praising their god for. However, it was doubtful he actually needed a reason. How many do you want me to catch? Silas asked, looking down at the valley ahead of them. They were a good mile east of their camp. Far below, movement could be seen as countless tiny creatures scurried about, feasting on the rich grass. How many? Coin echoed, his breath coming out in an angry huff. Yes, master. How many rabbits do you and the others desire? All of them, of course. All? I'm not sure. I... Coin reached up and smacked a gauntleted hand upside Silas's head. 
causing the young warrior to immediately blurt out, "'Thank you, sir. Has your stupidity made you deaf?' the dwarf asked crossly. "'Do you not hear it?' "'All I hear is the wind blowing through the trees. Perhaps your faith isn't as strong as it should be, then, for I hear whispers on that foul wind.' A look of panic crossed Silas's face. "'No, sir. I meant I hear them, too.' Then, after a moment, he asked, "'Um, what are the whispers saying?' "'Stupid boy. Your parents spit upon you from Twarig's side. If they hadn't been killed in battle, I've no doubt they'd have hung themselves in shame at seeing what a half-wit cretin their son had become.' Silas was quick to agree. He stepped to a nearby tree, cried out, "'I am a great disappointment indeed,' and then bashed his forehead into the bark. He repeated this twice more before Coin finally said, "'Enough of that for now. Save it for when you've finished your task.' He waited for Silas to wipe the blood off his face before pointing toward the valley. "'Long have the fell beasts of this vale vexed our lord and master.' "'We're still talking about rabbits, right?' Silas asked, receiving another slap from Coin. "'That's what they want you to think, if you ever bothered to do such a thing. "'It was Tuareg himself who came to me in a dream and told me. "'Once this was a valley populated by imps and goblins that refused to take our lord as their own. "'Tuareg was angered and the earth shook, and as punishment—' He turns them into stupid woodland animals. But why do I need to... Coin reached up, grabbed Silas by the ear, and dragged him down to his level. If you'd stop prattling long enough for me to draw breath, I'd tell you. Silence. This is a holy place. Say another idiotic word, and you could be struck down as well, although I doubt you'd rate high enough to be turned into a cockroach. Silas shut his mouth, his eyes wide with fear. Better. Despite our Lord's curse, these creatures continue to blaspheme his name. So we, and by we I mean you, have been tasked with bringing them to justice. Slay each and every rabbit within sight. Take no prisoners, give them no quarter. And above all else, do not return until you have finished. Am I clear? Silas nodded vigorously. Then go and complete your task so that perhaps Tuareg may despise you a bit less for your deeds. But not much. Silas shouldered his bow, made sure his quiver was full, and started down the steep path to the valley below. Before he'd gotten more than a few steps, Coin called to him. Oh, and Silas, what is best in life? The young warrior spun back despite the precarious footing. To worship Tuareg. And? And nothing. There are no other pleasures in life. Everything else is a sin to be... Coin smirked as Silas overbalanced and went tumbling end over end to the valley below, all while crying out his thanks to Tuareg. Satisfied, the abbot nodded and turned away. Stupid boy. So began the slaughter of Rabbit Hollow, for Silas's wrath was a terrible thing to behold, especially among creatures too weak to fight back, and far too stupid to know why they were being butchered. The young warrior worked tirelessly, stalking his prey through the high grass, lining up shot after shot, and then waiting for the survivors to stop running and resume munching on grass, "'Die, sinner!' he screamed, loosing another arrow. Hours passed, and the pile of rabbit corpses grew ever higher. Eventually, realizing this was going to continue for quite some time, I rose back up into the clouds to observe what was going on back at the dwarven encampment. Upon seeing the drunken debauchery taking place, I grew angry. It wasn't so much what they were doing— for the enjoyment of drink and women were not forbidden amongst Tuareg's followers, even those as twisted as Coin and his men. It was because they were hypocrites, 
enjoying their earthly revelries, while their young charge was denied even the most basic of pleasures. I spied Coin himself, cavorting naked with two infernaling whores, his heavy gut hanging nearly to the ground. Ah, the cruel irony, constantly beating into Silas the need to keep watch for demons, devils, and other hell-born creatures lest they tempt him, yet there was his master, happily slapping his cock against two girls who resembled nothing less than a pair of lithe succubi. It wasn't true. I knew that much. Infernlings were just as mortal as any of the other races in this world. It was said that in the distant past their ancestors consorted with demonic forces lending to their appearance, many of them horned and possessing reddish skin. But they were no more predisposed to evil than anyone else, even if their appearance suggested otherwise. Wait. Their appearance. As I watched the drunken revelry below, Coin and his followers eating, drinking, and fucking to their heart's content, a plan began to take shape in my mind. I had long since hoped to find some reason or cause to sway Silas away from the monsters who had raised him. A subtle nudge that would make him see these dwarves for the charlatans they were. Preferably something that wouldn't require much in the way of direct interference. Indirect interference, however, was another matter entirely. The orgy below showed no sign of ending any time soon. But I quickly realized that this was what I had been waiting for. A chance to free the boy who I had taken pity on so long ago. Surely... The sight of his masters, dwarves who claimed to follow the same path of suffering as he, engaging in acts of banal pleasure would give him cause to question his teachings, and if so, then the accursed shrine's hold over him would be broken, and he would be free. But first, I had to convince Silas to return, but I realized that, too, was possible. All I had to do was use his master's own words against him. Quick as the wind, I returned to the hollow to find the young warrior removing an arrow from yet another of the so-called blasphemous rabbits. May Tuareg shit upon you in death, as you have shat upon the field of his love and life, he proclaimed, somewhat nonsensibly, to the dead hare. He was an odd lad, but then all humans tended to be a bit strange as far as I was concerned. Knowing that he absolutely could not stop until his task was complete, I rose higher into the heavens and called out to the infinite power that surrounded the distant mountain of storm strike. Though the night was clear, lightning flew from the heavens at my command, striking the earth and sending the furry denizens of the valley scurrying for the safety of their dens. Again and again I called upon the storm until the only living being still standing on the field below was Silas. He looked to and fro, amazement etched upon his face. Then he scanned the floor of the small valley, noting no movement except the charred grass swaying in the breeze. Slay each and every rabbit within sight, he muttered to himself, echoing the words of the abbot. After a moment, he smiled raised his hands in the air, and screamed out, Praise Tuareg! The first part of my plan had been a success. Now it was time for Silas to learn the truth about his so-called masters and finally throw off the yoke of oppression he'd worn his entire life. The Best Laid Plans of Mice and Dwarves that's right, lass. Tickle me, asshole, with your tail. Yeah, just like that. If anything, the drunken revelry had gotten even more raucous in the time it took me to empty the field where Silas would have otherwise hunted rabbits until long past sunrise. As for the lad himself, he was quickly approaching the campsite, dragging a string of no less than two dozen dead rabbits behind him. I had to give him credit. He was nothing, if not thorough. I floated unseen above it all, 
waiting to see what would happen and anticipating the heated argument sure to ensue as Silas realized his entire life had been nothing but a cruel lie. It was possible the epiphany would break the boy, but ultimately it was easier to rip off the bandage than to let this mockery continue. Once his eyes were opened and he recognized their deception for what it was, then the healing could begin. My plan was to assume the form of a mortal and befriend him. Surely he would be in need of some sane companionship come that point. Silas stopped just outside the light of the campfire. Already I could see he'd noticed things were amiss. How could he not? The sight of naked, gyrating flesh, dwarven and infernling, entwined in a mass of writhing arms and legs, was hard to miss. Grunts, moans, and laughter could be heard as the orgy reached a fever pitch. I turned to see Silas drop the quarry he'd spent hours hunting. He took a step forward, then another, his face unreadable. This was it. The moment when the scales would be cast from his eyes, and he would see his mentors for what they truly were. I fully expected curses, lamenting, perhaps even tears to come next. What I didn't expect was for him to draw his bow and cry out, "'Die, foul demons! The power of Tuareg compels you!' There came the thwip of the weapon being loosed, and one of the infernling prostitutes fell dead atop Gutspear, with an arrow lodged deep in her back. So into his coupling was the dwarf, that he didn't immediately realize that the girl who'd been vigorously riding him was now little more than a twitching corpse. Though I had no corporeal body, I still felt the sensation of my eyes opening wide with surprise, as Silas let two more arrows fly, felling the pair of whores who'd been engaged with coin. The abbot stood up in shock, covered in nothing but the infernling's blood, he looked around and saw Silas knocking yet another arrow. The dwarf angrily balled his fists and cried out, "'What in the nine hells are you doing, you stupid boy?' As it turned out, that was a particularly poor choice of words. The abbot and his earnest student locked eyes for several long seconds, until Silas finally said, "'Fear not, master. I will release you from that demon's thrall.' In the next moment, the shrine of the shattered hammer was rendered leaderless, as Coin Copperbeard fell lifeless onto his bedroll, an arrow lodged deeply in his brain. Silas wasn't finished, though. Having apparently come to the insane conclusion that what he'd been watching was some kind of demonic possession, he proceeded to begin saving all who had taken part. Some of the dwarves pled with him, Others drunkenly stumbled for their weapons. In the end, it was the whores who doomed them all. Scared and not knowing why they were being attacked, they screamed as if they were banshees from the pit, drowning out the entreaties of the dwarfs until the lot of them were silenced for good. I watched this all in mute horror. I'd been warned to observe nothing more, but in my arrogance, I'd interfered and now stood witness to a massacre of my own making. Gutspear was the only dwarf to last long enough to mount some semblance of a defense. He was a hardened warrior, a seasoned guard of the shrine, and most likely more than a match for Silas. Had he chosen a spear or javelin, he might have made a difference, but he instead picked up his trusty warhammer, and charged into battle, allowing the young zealot more than enough time to fire his last two arrows. Both struck Gutspear true, one in his thigh, the other in his chest. Why? The dwarf managed to sputter before his voice became too choked with blood. Silas had no answer for him. He merely smiled, and then, when it was all over, he again raised his hands to the heavens and cried out, "'Thank you, Tuareg, for freeing my friends. May you stomp on their souls with your holy boots for all eternity!'
If Silas felt any remorse for his actions, he didn't show it. If anything, he continued to sing the praises of Tuareg as he piled up the bodies of the whores, doused them with rum, and then set their corpses ablaze. When you get to hell, tell them Tuareg sent you. I couldn't believe my ears. Was the boy crazed, or truly this stupid? These girls were obviously not demons. But then, in a moment of horrific clarity, I realized the fault was my own. There was no obvious from Silas's point of view. The boy hadn't seen a woman since his own mother perished. True, there were dwarven females at the shrine, but since most humans found it nearly impossible to tell dwarves apart from their mates, it was understandable that there wasn't much insight to be gleaned there. Silas's ears had been polluted for decades by talk of demons and devils. I now realized my error. For what else would he have mistaken these women for? The pyre burning bright, Silas next attempted to tie the bodies of the dwarves together, much as he'd done with the rabbits, but they proved too heavy for one man to move alone. He sat for a moment, as if pondering this dilemma, I hoped that perhaps the time would allow him to consider what he'd done. I wasn't entirely fearful for the boy's soul. He'd acted out of ignorance, not malice. Something the gods take into consideration. And, truth be told, he'd killed a group who my lord considered to be little more than heretical louses. But it was the principle of the thing. At last he stood as if making up his mind. I could only watch and pray that he'd finally come to his senses. What the ever-living fuck is this? The guard cried, as the heads of Coin, Gutspear, Gorlam, and all the rest who'd been on the pilgrimage tumbled out of the sack and rolled across the threshold of the shrine. Rejoice, Silas said with a smile, for they are free. They're dead. True but it's a small price to pay for being delivered from the thrall of demons. A small price? You killed them. Their bodies were already tainted beyond repair, but now their spirits reside at the right heel of Tuareg, so that he may rest his feet upon their backs whenever he is tired from a long day of smiting the unworthy. More dwarves began to gather at the entrance of the shrine to listen to Silas's tale. One by one, I saw fear begin to spread on their faces. Too late, they realized what they'd done, that their weapon of faith had backfired into their own faces. Silas stepped forward, and immediately several of the dwarves backed away from him. Why wouldn't they? Their best and brightest had been reduced to nothing more than a pile of heads lying on the ground and their killer was standing there smiling as if expecting a pat on the back. Murmurs rose up among the assembled dwarfs. Why did he do it? It's Dwarag's vengeance against us. Should we attack him? Are you crazy? He killed them all by himself. I will admit to being curious as to what would happen next, as it was my meddling which had caused this. Still, It was hard to bring myself to feel too sorry for the dwarves of the shrine, even as they cowered from Silas. Coin and his most ardent followers had been, after all, nothing but burrs in Tuareg's ass for years. Confusion reigned for several long minutes until one of the acolytes regained his senses enough to come up with a plan, simple yet brilliant that would allow them time to discuss this new and disturbing predicament. Thank you, Silas. A dwarf by the unfortunate name of Porker Fangbottom cried out, I am certain that Tuareg thanks you for your actions. Why don't you return to your stable, so that we might, er, rejoice in the abbot having finally been granted the joy of eternal beatings by our lord? The dull-witted warrior clapped his hands together in apparent joy. Should I perform the ritual of bloody soul cleansing? Porker shrugged. Sure, why not? In fact, whip yourself extra hard for the sins of those who have fallen. 
This appeared to please Silas greatly. Without another word, he turned and walked off to the dirty horse pen he called home. While Silas was busy thinking of new and interesting ways to bloody himself in the name of Tuareg, the rest of the shrine's population locked themselves away so as to debate who should lead and what this meant for their future and, most importantly, how to deal with the threat Silas had become. Some were adamant that he be killed. Do it while he sleeps, they shouted. Lock the doors and burn the stable around him. Others argued against that, citing the time and effort already invested into the boy, as if he were nothing more than a gold nugget dug out from beneath a mountain. Whatever the argument, both sides agreed on one thing. He could not be allowed to stay at the shrine. He'd become too dangerous. Back and forth they went as I hovered invisible in the room, waiting to see what they would decide. I still believed Silas to be a victim, and so was curious what my reaction would be if they concluded that his sentence should be death. I'd interfered where I should have stayed my hand and made a great fuckery of things in the process. Already I could hear the rumble of divine thunder overhead, undetectable to all but the most devout of mortals. It told me that my master was aware. Tuareg was not yet quite angry with me, but my actions had most certainly been noticed. And now he was watching. If Silas's fate was to die, would I allow it? Or would I step in and whisk him away at the last moment? Fortunately, my resolve was not put to the test, for come the rise of the morning sun, an agreement was reached among the dwarves. Porker Fangbottom, newly appointed abbot of the Shrine of the Shattered Hammer, approached the stable where Silas was already hard at work. Fresh new welts stood out on his back as he toiled to groom the ill-tempered ponies that he shared a residence with. Each time he was kicked or bitten, he would sing out his thanks to Tuareg. Enough of that, the new abbot said. Though there was steel in his voice, I could see the nervousness in his eyes as he dropped a bundle of supplies at Silas's feet. Here, this is for you. Ah, yes, laundry, Silas cried. I will get to it at once, for it is written, though the unworthy cannot wash away their sins, dirt is another matter entirely. No, you misunderstand me, Silas. This is for you. It's yours. The young man inclined his head. Mine? But I own nothing except the rags I wear, and with good reason, for Tuareg— Yes, yes, Tuareg despises you, we all know that. Porker interrupted. But that was before. Now you have proven yourself, and as such it's time for you to be assigned a holy quest. A quest? Surely there are others here who are far more worthy of such an honor. Porker shrugged. True enough, but that just means you have to try even harder. This equipment will help you. Silas was hesitant at first, but then he reached down to the pile, discovering among the items an old moth-eaten set of leather armor adorned with the upside-down hammer that symbolized the shrine's faith. It belonged to your father. My father, Silas asked. But I was told he was captured by the enemies of Tuareg, mauled by dogs, and then eaten by pigs. Porker blinked several times. His eyes opened wide in panic. Yes, but he was stripped naked first. We retrieved his belongings after he was dead. That seemed to satisfy Silas. Praise Tuareg! Praise him indeed. Now get dressed already and be quick about it. But this is the only home I have ever known. No more, Porker said, flanked by several guards. From this time forward, your mission, your sacred quest, as handed down by Tuareg himself, I couldn't help but laugh in my incorporeal state. It was hard to tell what was sadder, the stew of horse shit that Porker was serving, 
or that Silas seemed eager to eat it up and ask for seconds. You are to go forth from this place. Seek out the land of men. There you will spread the word of Tuareg to those who are worthy and mete out his vengeance upon those who deserve it. But none are worthy, master. The new abbot shrugged, as if this were a minor detail. Fine. Those who really deserve it. Whatever. You are charged with smiting evil wherever you find it, crush it, show it no mercy, work tirelessly in your duty. I will do as you say or die miserably trying. We can only hope so. Porker nervously glanced at the other dwarves before continuing. Er, uh, what I meant was, you are not to return here until such time as you have converted everyone, until... Tuareg's name is the first word uttered by every man, woman, and child when they wake in the morning and the last before they collapse in their beds at night. Go forth in his name, Silas Kane, as his warrior, his champion, his paladin. It shall be done, Silas cried, decked out in his new armor and carrying a bow and fresh quiver of arrows. On his back he wore a pack containing a threadbare blanket, a few days of moldy rations, his favorite whip, and of course the heretical book of Tuareg's teachings that he'd studied since he was a child. The dwarves made a good show of cheering Silas on as he walked away into the wilderness, his so-called destiny laid out for him. As soon as he was out of sight, though, Porker turned to the guards standing atop the walls. If you ever see him return, shoot him dead on sight. And with that, the gates of the shrine were closed and double barred. To piss off a saint. Silas wandered for days, while I busied myself pondering the opportunity that had been practically handed to me. I wished for him to put some distance between himself and the shrine's foul influence. It likewise didn't hurt to allow a bit of time to pass between our meeting and my previous infraction, allowing the rumble of godly thunder to grow quiet again. Silas, for his part, seemed to take his exile in good cheer, albeit on his first night out he did shoot a pair of squirrels that made the mistake of chattering during his evening prayers. All the while, I subtly influenced his path, felling a tree limb here, or making a stream run a bit wilder there. To the north lay the Iron Plains, an excellent place for warriors looking to earn a bit of coin. But the people of the plains had a reputation for being wary of strangers due to their isolation at the frontier of the kingdom. No. I thought the best course for Silas was to lead him south toward civilization in all its myriad forms. There he could immerse himself in the diverse stew of life, and see that not everything need be black and white. Yes, there was plenty of wickedness in this world, but there was good too. He needed to be able to differentiate between them in ways that went beyond the rigid dogma of the one true book of Tuareg which he made a point to study every morning and night, despite knowing the reviled text by heart. On the third day, I saw the seeds of my hope take root, for Silas came upon a farmer whose wagon had broken a wheel. The old man had repaired it well enough, but lacked the proper strength to remount it so as to be on his way. Upon Silas's approach, the old man grew wary, no doubt worried about bandits, but his countenance improved visibly upon seeing that Silas was alone. Praise be to the gods, the old man called out. I was hoping a fit young lad such as yourself would come along. Might I trouble you for a bit of help? You should give praise only to Tuareg, Silas replied, for it is his path and his path alone I walk. The old man shrugged. I'll praise whoever you tell me to, if an, you can help me fix this blasted wheel. Fix it, eh? I watched from afar, as the young warrior appeared to study the wagon for several minutes. At last he stood 
and turned to the farmer. Um, have you tried praying? Ay, the old man replied with a sigh. I prayed that someone with a strong back would stop and help me, and lo and behold, here ye are. That seemed to satisfy the warrior. Just as Silas was about to lift the side of the wagon for the man, to hammer the wheel back in place, though, he hesitated. You're not a demon sent to tempt me, are you? The old farmer turned and spat into the nearby foliage. Tempt you with what, boy? My mule? Just checking. He finished helping the farmer make his repairs. As way of showing gratitude, the old man offered Silas a hot meal back at his farm and a bed to sleep in. My heart soared at hearing his words, for surely that was what the boy needed, some companionship and a little kindness to show him how badly he'd been mistreated in years past. Sadly, that ended a scant mile later, when the farmer kicked Silas off after he wouldn't shut up about Tuareg, telling the warrior, "'I'll worship your blasted god out me ass, but only after my ears have stopped bleeding. Be sure you do. Have a blessed day, and don't forget to praise Tuareg!' Silas called to the retreating wagon before turning and continuing on. Oh well. At least it had ended better than his encounter with the whores. Though he had only met that one traveler in his journey so far, it was enough for me to see he showed no signs of deviating on his own from what he'd been taught. I'd hoped Silas would be like a dog, freed from its cage, after a lifetime of feeling the boot of its cruel master, that he'd get his first taste of what it was like to run wild, and with it would come the revelation of how wrong his prior life had been. But no, this dog had grown to like being kicked. It was time to step in and teach him there was more to life. I considered perhaps sending a herd of wild boar his way, and then stepping in to save him but that felt a wee bit too melodramatic. The boy had been raised by the fist. Though he would no doubt be comfortable with any activity involving bloodshed, I thought a different approach was called for. Besides, it had been far too long since I'd donned flesh and enjoyed some of the simple pleasures that life afforded. A short while later, Silas approached the clearing where I awaited him. A side of pork was roasting over an open fire, the sweet smell carried on the breeze I'd conjured, pushing it the would-be paladin's way. Next to me sat a pitcher of the finest ale, something to cool a parched throat after a long day of walking. All was perfect. I'd considered taking the guise of a simple mortal, a mere traveler on the road, but opted instead to appear as myself. As he entered the clearing, he spied me adorned in my gleaming plate armor with my mighty axe, Doom Splitter, at my side. Though I wore the same flesh as before my ascension, the divine power crackling off me made it painfully obvious that I was not of this world. The look on Silas's face as he approached told me he understood my divinity. His eyes were wide, and he had a wistful look upon his face. May Tuareg bless you, stranger. He already has, I replied with a knowing grin. Come, sit with me. Silas hesitated, though. Are you? Am I him? No. His face dropped ever so slightly. I suppose it was too much to hope for. My name is Theodin Grimstrike, and I sit at Tuareg's right hand in the mountain known as... Hold on. What are you doing? Before I could even finish my introduction, Silas had already thrown himself at my feet, tears in his eyes, and began showering my boots with kisses. Stop that! He spied my axe and pointed to it. Please, sir, beat me senseless with your weapon. What? Lop off my useless arm so that I might learn humility. That's not what— or my legs, so that I might crawl in the dirt forever like the filthy worm I am. For Tuareg's sake, have some dignity, man. Dignity is a sin, O oh, merciless one, Silas muttered 
his lips still glued to my boots. Self-respect, too. This was not going quite as I'd planned. I tried to be rational, asked him to stop groveling, to stand up and act like a man, but I might as well have been talking to a tree stump. Finally, I grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and dragged him back to his feet. Knock it off or I'll split your fucking skull. I hadn't meant to lose my temper, but it was the only thing that seemed to get through to him, albeit it was less fear I saw in his eyes and more wistful anticipation. Before he could ask if I was serious about cleaving his head in, I pointed toward a log on the far side of the fire. Sit your ass there and grab some food. Silas did as told, at least on the sitting part. I watched for several long seconds, trying to figure out the rest. Tell me, boy, is there a reason you're digging in the dirt? He looked up. I'm searching for some grubs. Why, pray tell. You told me to grab food. I was simply looking for a meal worthy of a maggot such as... Grab some pork, you bleeding idiot! Go. This wasn't going as I'd planned. I hadn't set out to scream at the lad, but he had a way about him that was best described as brain-meltingly stupid. I took a deep swallow from my flagon of ale and decided that I'd start again after we'd eaten. Perhaps a good meal likely the first proper one he'd eaten since being pulled from his dead mother's teat, would open his eyes a bit. That's right. Take a big bite. Silas did as I ordered him to, ripping off a large hunk of pork. I expected a look of nirvana to pass before his eyes at the exquisitely spiced meat. But all I saw was confusion. What's the matter? You don't like it? He chewed for an extra long time before finally swallowing. I don't know. How do you not know? Is it supposed to have this much flavor? Of course! Silas nodded and dumped the rest onto the ground. Then I don't like it. What? This is a test, isn't it? Don't worry. I've studied the scripture thoroughly. For it was written that the great god Tuareg looked down at his servants in their homes, and he was displeased for they spent more time preparing their food than they did praying. And verily he did drop his breeches and drown them in his holy excretions for their transgression. Your lesson is not lost upon me, O mighty one. Flavor is sinful. What? That's ridiculous. Forget that nonsense and take another bite. Silas shook his head, that idiotic grin still on his face. The salt of sin shall not sour my lips. Fear not, I will resist the temptation. It's not temptation, it's just supper. A sinful supper, that's the worst kind. I took another bite, then spat it out, my appetite gone in the face of the boy's ignorance. Seeing the rapturous look on his face, I quickly added, It was just some grizzle. Don't get your bridges in a bunch. I'm not wearing any. I prefer my armor to chafe. That was far more than I truly cared to know. Not what I meant. Oh, then... I pointed toward his backpack. Haven't you ever questioned anything written in that blasted book? It was time to get to the point. No. Not even some of the more ridiculous shite that scribbled in it? With Tuareg... Nothing is ridiculous. Nothing? Of course not. Fortunately, I was familiar with the so-called scripture he'd studied. I'd spent some time reading through it, and it was as if whoever wrote the damned thing hadn't the foggiest idea about the true nature of Tuareg. Either that, or they'd purposefully ignored it. Considering where the dwarfs of the shrine originated from, I had to assume the latter— but that was neither here nor there. What mattered was that some of the tales by these heathens wouldn't have made a convincing bedtime story for even the stupidest child. I decided to throw one of the worst offenders back in this fool's face. What about that preposterous tale of the flood? 
Silas perked up. I know it well. Tuareg appeared to a human named Noah and told him that he must build a massive ship out of wood because he planned to drown the world and all the sinners in it. Yes, I know you don't have to recite this stupid thing. I simply meant Noah worked for years to build the ship, laboring to complete it and forcing his family to work their fingers to the bone alongside him. Then, when it was finally finished, he worked tirelessly to fill it with two of each creature upon the land, so that, once the world was pure again, they could go forth and multiply. I tried to interrupt, but the boy wasn't to be stopped once he started. And then, Silas decreed with a big smile, the rains came, the world was flooded, and the vessel capsized in the ensuing torrent. Noah was drowned along with everyone aboard his ark. All the while, Tuareg sat with the dwarves in their waterproofed mines and shared a laugh at the stupidity of man. Ah, uh-huh. There it was. Do you see what I mean? Preposterous. How so? If Tuareg drowned all the long legs, then how do you explain all the people in the world today? Do they sprout from rocks? Silas turned his head and looked around, as if afraid of being watched. Then he lowered his voice. Wickedness finds a way. That's moronic. And true. No, it's not. If it's not, then why is it written in the one true book of Tuareg? It says so right on the cover. Everything inside is true. That's circular logic. By the blank look on Silas's face, I realized... This was a concept that perhaps his dull mind wasn't prepared to consider. So I decided on a different course of action. You do realize that book was written by dwarves, right? Of course. Dwarves inspired by Tuareg's awesome righteousness. And how do you know those dwarves didn't lie? Because lying is a sin. Obviously, but that wouldn't mean anything to a sinner. No, but dwarves are Tuareg's chosen people and are thus exempt from certain rules. Who told you that? The dwarves at the shrine. Of course they did. I was beginning to fear that this was going nowhere fast. So, you say lying is a sin, and all wicked things are sinners, yes? Indeed. It is why I whip myself every night, so that I might hope to purge myself of the disgrace that is ever present in my... Not what I was asking. I snapped. It was beginning to become clear why the farmer had lost his temper with the boy. What I meant was that Tuareg is good, right? The greatest good there is. Why, there is no gooder good in this vast universe. The only reason the word good isn't called Tuareg, instead, is because Tuareg is so good that even the word good cannot encompass his goodness. I blinked for several seconds, trying to understand the word vomit Silas had just puked up all over the forest floor. Uh Uh-huh. So, tell me this, then. If Tuareg is so good, then how do you explain how he killed the entire world in your foolish story? Are you saying that everyone is wicked, down to even the most innocent of babies? I had hoped to stump him with sound logic, but... I was quickly learning that logic had no place in the mind of Silas Kane. He leaned in. All except the chosen people are born as festering piles of sin. And babies are the most wicked because they are too stupid to realize it. As we all know, ignorance of sin is one of the greatest sins of all. So you're saying that killing mere babies because they don't know... I couldn't continue with that thought. Who knew what the moron would say next? Already I could feel my hand itching to grab hold of Doom Splitter and use it to beat some sense into this idiot, which is almost certainly what he wanted. Grr! This was one of the problems with assuming mortal flesh. While I existed in the ether, I could rise above petty moral issues, such as being annoyed to all shit by one human's base stupidity. Taking on flesh and blood again tended to also open me up to having that blood boil. 
I needed to remember my divinity, and that I was here on a mission of mercy to save this fool despite himself. Perhaps that was my mistake. I was trying to talk to Silas like a man, when I should have been talking to him as one who has walked amongst the gods. "'Hear me, boy, and hear me well,' I called upon a fraction of my power, and began to glow, power crackling around my body. "'I am Theoden Grimstrike, servant to Tuareg, and I will not suffer your ignorance any longer!' Silas dropped to his knees, his eyes wide with, at first I thought, awe, but then I saw it was actually closer to delight. He held his arms out to the side and cried, Yes, strike me down, for I am ignorant. Tuareg is a god of valor, not vengeance, I bellowed. Yes, beat me with his valor, too. What? No. Tuareg doesn't smite people simply because he can. Silas nodded vigorously. Of course not, mighty Grimstrike. I am not worthy of being beaten by him. You do it. I'm not going to beat you. Praise Tuareg, he screamed, for I am not even worthy to be pummeled by his servant. That isn't what I meant. This was getting me nowhere. I had thought that by appearing as myself I might get through to him but he had an insane answer for every nugget of common sense I threw his way. Much as I had despised Coin for what he'd done to the boy, I had to admit he'd been thorough. I had never seen a mind as badly poisoned as Silas's. It was as if he'd been born an empty wineskin, which they'd filled with nothing but the maniacal teachings of those at the shrine. And now every fiber of his being was saturated with it, it was going to take a great deal of work on my part to scrub it all out of him. I realized too late that doing so as a demigod was also a mistake. Silas considered himself to be a lowly dog, so perhaps that's how he needed to be taught from the ground up. I considered where we were and the nearest city to us, and a plan began to form. One that would almost certainly open Silas's eyes to the wider world around him. Once more gathering power around me, I looked down upon him and let my voice boom out across the forest. Listen and listen well. Tuareg has a mission for you. Mission of Misery the port city of Kel appeared somewhat unremarkable upon first glance. Considered small by city standards, it was originally founded as little more than a fishing village on the shores of the Direblood estuary. It might have stayed that way indefinitely, as the surrounding land was too acidic for crops, thanks to a persistent infestation of pepper grubs, and the nearby forest made for dangerous hunting because of the presence of feral goblin tribes. Due to its unique location, though, Kel eventually evolved into the gateway between the kingdom and the strange lands across the sea. However, the captains that put into port weren't usually interested in spice or gems. Their commodity of choice was flesh. As a result... A vibrant slave trade had arisen in Kel. There, humanoids of all shapes and sizes could be bought and sold for the right price. If you needed strong backs for your field, Kel was the place to buy them. If you were looking for exotic wenches to work your brothels, a trip to Kel would serve you well. So it was that the city grew and prospered, built upon the backs of those sold within its marketplace. And so, too, did Kel earn its nickname, the City of Tears. For though some grew fat and rich within its walls, the suffering of the vast majority was great indeed. Truly theirs was a sad fate, for though there were many within the kingdom sympathetic to the plight of slaves, there was little that anyone would do to stop it so long as the gold continued to flow. I explained all of this to Silas, or tried to, in between his constant interruptions to praise Tuareg. I swear, 
I once thought it impossible to tire of hearing my lord's name, but this fool was rapidly testing my limits. I think I understand, he said at last. Do you really? Yes. You want me to go to Kel so I can convert both the slaves and their masters over to Tuareg? What? No, you bloody fool. That's not even remotely what I said. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of slaves within the city, and all of them are suffering. Because they haven't read the one true book of... No! Because they're beaten within an inch of their lives on a regular basis. Upon seeing Silas's eyes light up, I quickly added, And they don't enjoy it. Finally, some semblance of understanding began to appear in the imbecile's face. Ah... I get it now. I can only pray that you do. Know this. Despite all the shit that's been poured into your ears, Tuareg is a god of valor and honor. And there is no honor among those sons of drow bitches who run that place. Most are godless dogs stealing children in the night so as to profit off their backs. You are a paladin in our lord's name, are you not? I am not worthy to be called... It's a yes or no question. Oh. He looked confused for a moment. Um, then I guess I am. Good enough. I placed a hand upon Silas's shoulder and let a small sliver of my lord's grace pass into the boy, hoping I didn't regret this. Then hear me, O oh mighty paladin. Great are the number of those who suffer in Kel. I charge you in Tuareg's name with helping to ease, nay, end that suffering for as many as you are able to. Faint thunder sounded in the distance as I let the weight of my words sink in, hoping he understood the gravity of what I was asking. And then convert them to Tuareg? Silas asked sheepishly. I glanced longingly at my axe, but somehow managed to stay my hand. Yes, okay, fine. If you can convert them to Tuareg, do it. But only as a side quest. First and foremost is their suffering. Take care of that, and I won't give an owlbear's ass who they do or don't worship. Is that clear? Silas furrowed his brows for several seconds, as if testing out the concept of thought. Finally, he stood up tall. Yes, my mission is clear. I shall end the suffering of those in Kel. Good. Then be off with you. Now! Silas grabbed his belongings and ran off into the forest without any further hesitation. To the south, you fucking twat! I screamed after him. Thank you, servant of Tuareg! He shouted back, quickly changing direction. I took several deep breaths to steady my nerves. There was no doubt I'd need to keep tabs on the boy, but it would have to be done subtly. I'd already interfered more than enough. This quest was his, and his alone. I reached out with my senses, but all was silent once more. The divine thunder I heard moments earlier had quieted, telling me that perhaps my lord agreed with this course of action, for now anyway. At the very least... He was hopefully taking a wait-and-see approach. If successful, the boy would bring succor to those in need. In doing so, I hoped it would lead to an epiphany regarding his own life. I envisioned a future where Silas threw off the yoke of his oppressors and became a true champion of the downtrodden, devoting himself to helping those less fortunate than he. That would be quite the satisfactory outcome not to mention a kick in the balls to those fucks back at the shrine. Of course, first he had to actually get there, and then somehow manage not to tick off the city guard, but one step at a time. I prepared to abandon my flesh and soar once more above the world, but then my eyes spied the casket of ale. Silas hadn't touched his share. It would be a shame to let it go to waste. Besides... I had earned a couple of stiff drinks. Silas continued heading southwest. Though there were trails to follow, not to mention an actual road leading to Kel, he kept to the forest, heading straight and true, 
pausing to thank Tuareg for every branch that slapped him in the face, every root that tripped him, and every bird that shat upon his head. Incorporeal again, having shed my earthly form, I caught up with him some days later, when he was still a few miles from his destination. He was filthy from his trip, but seemed to be in good spirits. Though I couldn't read the hearts and minds of mortals, I prayed that he'd taken some time to think about what he'd spoken of. If even a single sentence I'd told him had sunk in, it would be a positive start. It was nearly dusk when his path led him from the forest and to the main road leading to Kel. Though it was still too far away to smell the salt water of the estuary, the chill that rolled off the water could be felt in the air. "'Who goes there?' a voice cried out from ahead. Two shapes approached out of the shadows. Beyond them, a fire illuminated several covered wagons that had stopped along the road for the night. "'If you're a thief, know that the only treasure waiting here is the iron we'll use to run you through.' the second guard called out. "'May Tuareg bless you,' Silas greeted back. "'Who?' the first. A gorilla of a man asked, his hand resting on the sword at his side. "'Tuareg,' Silas explained. "'The great god of dwarves who oversees the universe and... "'You don't look like a dwarf. "'I'm not worthy to be one, and for that my punishment is eternal.' The two guards glanced at each other, as if debating whether to welcome the stranger or cut him down. But then another man approached from the direction of the fire. "'What's going on over here?' "'Our apologies, Mr. Festivus,' the first guard said. "'This man approached us from the woods. We were making sure he wasn't a bandit.' "'Are you?' the newcomer, Festivus, turned towards Silas. He was short and plump with white hair and a neatly trimmed beard. Where the guards wore shoddy leather armor, he was clothed in the fine robes of a merchant. "'He's no bandit,' the second guard replied. "'Just some idiot who thinks he's a dwarf.' Festivus scowled at the man. "'Did I ask your opinion?' "'No, sir. Then assume I didn't want it.' He again addressed Silas. "'So you think you're a dwarf?' "'Of course not.' Silas said with a laugh. I am not worthy to be among the chosen people. I am merely a lowly warrior in the service of Tuareg. And uh, what is your name, lowly warrior? Silas Kane. Well met, Silas Kane. He held out a hand. They call me Maximus Festivus, or Max Fest to my friends, because I know a good time when I see it. A good time? Silas asked sounding confused. Yes, my new friend, a good time, such as sharing a meal and perhaps a story around the fire. Why, I was just wishing for some company to pass the time with, and then you came along. Please, come join me. Silas turned and pointed down the road. I'm heading to Kell on a holy mission. I shouldn't... Quite the fortunate coincidence, then, Max said, clapping his hands together in glee. We're heading there, too. But the roads are a treacherous place at night, and my cargo is precious. He turned and indicated the covered wagons. How about this? Rest up here where it's safe. If you're insistent on earning your keep, you can accompany us to Kell in the morning. Another strong arm standing guard during these last few miles wouldn't be unwelcome. I was curious to hear what Silas would say. But after a moment's consideration, he nodded and followed Max back to the fire. Come, his host said, passing a bowl of stew. Sit and regale us with tales of your travels to pass the time. Two hours later, Silas was still talking about Tuareg. By then the guards had all retreated to the far edges of the fire's light. Though they told their master that it was to better keep watch, their faces said otherwise, as Silas continued to tirelessly proselytize. "'And it is by the command of his righteous fury that I make my journey,' Silas said, finally pausing to drink some water, his voice having grown hoarse some time ago. "'Huh?' 
Max perked up from where he'd nodded off and blinked several times to clear the cobwebs. Truly a fascinating tale, good warrior. I'm happy to tell you more if... No! Max cried, a look of panic in his eyes that he quickly covered up. What I meant to say is, perhaps I can hear more later. Truly your knowledge of things spiritual is staggering. Alas, my own business in Kell is somewhat more practical in nature. I'm looking to sell my wares at a profit during the... What greater profit could there be than giving your heart to Dwarag? Several groans could be heard from the far edges of the camp. Not this again. Doesn't he ever shut up? Should have cut him down when we had the chance. If Silas heard them, he gave no indication. He continued to prattle on, heedless of what his host had to say. At last, Max held up a hand. I think I've heard all I need. It's getting late, and an old man like me needs his rest. Please join me for a drink so that we might toast our good fortune in meeting one another. The clerics of the shrine allowed me to drink from the dishwater bucket whenever I felt parched. If you have some, I would be happy to toast. I'm fresh out of dishwater, sadly, but that's okay. Only the finest wine for my friends. Max clapped his hands, and one of his servants approached, carrying two cups. He handed one to his master and one to Silas. The young warrior looked at it dubiously. I've never tasted this beverage before, but I'm fairly sure it's sinful. Sinful? Are you saying it's wrong to raise a toast with your new converts? Because I like what I'm hearing about this Tuareg, but if you're saying we can't, then maybe I should think twice. No! Silas's eyes opened wide, and he quickly raised his glass. Let us toast to the greatness that is Tuareg! He took a gulp of the wine, slugging it back as fast as he could. Max smiled and put his cup down. Very good. Come, my friend. Before we turn in, I'd like to show you my wares. He stood and led Silas over to the largest of his wagons. He lifted the cover at the rear, revealing the iron door of a cage. Inside, packed in tightly, were several filthy men and women. They all cowered away from the door as they caught the sight of Maximus, their eyes downcast and frightened. So, tell me, Silas, what do you think? The young warrior stared hard at the cage and its inhabitants for several seconds before turning to the slave master. "'Tis a fine home. Why, had I even dreamt of such luxurious quarters as a boy, I'd have been whipped for the sin of avarice. Excuse me? Max asked, sounding taken aback. Silas began to sway on his feet. Yes, were I raised in such finery, I would have considered myself rich indeed. But then wealth is a sin, so it is perhaps for the best. He shook his head, his eyelids beginning to droop. Max grinned back, his smile suddenly predatory. I see. And if you were to find yourself in there among your new brothers and sisters, do you think you would still sing the praises of your god? Sing the praises of Tuareg? Silas slurred. I would scream to the heavens about the glory that is... I couldn't help but think he would have surely admonished himself for not finishing that sentence. But the poor fool was too busy passing out from the obviously drugged wine he'd been fed. Prisoner of Tuareg A part of me felt bad for Silas, but he'd brought it upon himself. Besides, I quickly realized this new situation— might prove even better for his education. It was a chance for him to see the true suffering of others up close. Nevertheless, I planned to keep an eye on him. I'd led him to this place and wouldn't abandon him so easily, especially after the ordeal he'd suffered growing up. Silas's eyes fluttered as the morning sun rose. 
and he awoke to find himself inside the same cage he'd been shown some hours earlier. My heart broke as he looked down upon his scarred body and the filthy loincloth he now wore, no doubt realizing all of his worldly possessions had been stolen from him. Understanding seemed to dawn in his eyes as he found himself surrounded by slaves. Most refused to meet his eyes, as if ashamed they didn't try to warn him of the fate which had befallen him. He continued to look around, taking stock of his misfortune. I expected disbelief or a wail of grief, for what else could one do in such a situation? But once again, I was wrong. Praise Tuareg! One of the slaves, older than the rest, and perhaps a little bolder because of it, stepped to Silas's side. Shh, be quiet. The master doesn't like us to speak. Silas pulled himself to his feet and stretched as well as he could in the cramped confines of the wagon cage. I would sooner slit my own throat than not sing the praises of Tuareg. That can be arranged. Silas turned to find one of the guards from the night before, standing outside the cage doors. Good morning to you, friend. Shut up, slave. Perhaps we didn't meet properly last night. My name is Silas Kane. I am a paladin of... The guard jabbed a wooden staff through the bars, slamming it into Silas's gut and driving him to his knees. You don't have a name until your new master gives you one. Thank you, Tuareg, Silas gasped. And stop thanking your god. He can't help you now. Silas laughed and stood back up. Of course not. Tuareg doesn't help filth such as me. He would sooner throw me into his divine chamber pot and defecate upon me for eternity. It is what makes him so glorious. If you will kindly give me my scripture back, I would be happy to explain. Your scripture, the guard said with a laugh. You mean that paper I wiped my ass with this morning? As for the rest of your stuff, it's ours now. Slaves don't own shit unless we feed it to them. What do you think about that? Amazingly, Silas smiled back. That's fine. I know it all by heart anyway. I'll happily recite it to you as we journey onward. The guard looked like he was about to strike Silas again, as if that would do any good. But then he abruptly turned as Maximus stepped into view. How goes our newest acquisition? We might need to cut this one's tongue out, the guard replied. In fact, I'm sure we will. No damaging the merchandise, Max said. I expect this one to fetch top dollar at the market. Look at his physique. Hard to tell with all the scars. It just means he's no stranger to discipline. I'll say, the guard mused. I think this fucker likes it. Don't be ridiculous. Of course I enjoy it, Silas said, stepping to the bars. A life in which my faith is not constantly tested isn't a life worth living. Why, I would gladly spend eternity with the hot pokers of Tuareg's love shoved in my... I said shut it, the guard growled, slamming his staff into Silas's crotch this time and causing the would-be paladin to crumble to the floor of the wagon. Despite the blow, he was still able to squeak. Thank you, Tuareg! See what I mean? The guard said. Max sighed and ran a hand through his beard. Maybe you're right. Let's try to sell this one before word gets out. So it was that Silas Kane was brought through the gates of Kell not as a warrior, but as a mere slave. He was actually quiet for once as he passed into the city and was driven down its packed streets. However, I sensed it wasn't despair which quelled his lips, for no matter how hard the guards tried on the journey up, they hadn't been able to silence him. No, the look of wonder on his face said it all. He'd never in his life seen a place like this, with its tall buildings and myriad races all comingling in the rancid stew of city life. Humans, elves, orcs, bugbears, gnomes, and various half-breeds could be seen going about their business. Silas's eyes opened even wider once he spied a pair of infernlings shopping for fruit at a market. 
I hoped seeing them simply living their lives among other people would show him the error of his ways, but he hunkered down and watched them as the wagon slowly drew on, uttering only five words. This place must be cleansed. For the barest of seconds, I found myself glad the young paladin was in chains, but I quickly dismissed it, and instead focused on the trials and tribulations that lay ahead. Certainly, that should have been my biggest concern. Yet, in the pit of my gut, I couldn't help but wonder whether I was wrong. Maximus peddled his wares in the marketplace with the skills of an expert haggler. It was the Day of Flesh in Kel, a monthly event in which slavers from far and wide came to do business, buying and selling their living produce and hoping to make enough coin to fill their pockets. Come, fine sir, and view this strapping lad you see before you. His back is strong, and he is well used to long hours of labor. Why, his last owner was in tears at having to sell him to me, but, you see, hard times have befallen him, and uh, you have a nice day, sir. You, over there. I watched him change his story six times in as many minutes as he tried to sell Silas, hoping to fetch top dollar for his newest slave. Depending on who you were, you might have heard that Silas had been sold into debt, captured in a great battle, or specifically bred for servitude. The truth didn't matter. It was changed to suit whatever Maximus thought fit each potential customer. Unfortunately, strong of back Silas might have been, but his incessant tongue kept many a buyer at bay. Sadly for Max, there were only so many beatings his men could administer in public. It wasn't that he feared the town guard. After all, the laws in Kell were very much in favor of masters doing as they pleased with their property, but fresh bruises were a known bargaining chip that could be used to drive down the asking price. I swear if you ruin one more sale, he finally snarled at Silas, I will rip out your vocal cords and feed them to you myself. If Tuareg wills it, then I shall gladly enjoy such a meal. Gah. Just please quiet down a bit. For me? Well, Max ran a hand through his white hair. How about doing it for Tuareg? Only if he commands it to be so. Really? I mean, yes, he, er, uh, just came to me in a vision, said to tell you to shut the fuck up, or else. Silas's eyes opened wide with fear. He closed his mouth and became instantly silent. Thank goodness. Now maybe I can... What have you got here today, Max? Anything interesting? The merchant turned and then backed up a step at the sight of two glowering bugbears who stood in front of him. Then he glanced down at the finely dressed gnome standing between them. Well, well, dingus glitterfinger, to what do I owe the honor? You know how it is, the gnome said with a wave of his bejeweled hand. I had to crucify half a dozen slaves last week after their output dropped by twelve percent. Good motivation for the rest, but now I need to replace them. Is that so? I hope you don't mind me saying that your loss is hopefully both our potential gain. Perhaps. How much for this one? Ah, you have a good eye, my friend. This fine specimen was captured after a massive manhunt following his escape from... Spare me the bullshit story. How much? Three hundred. Three hundred, eh? Dingus replied, eyeing Silas. I don't know. He doesn't look that bright to me. Your competitor, Fallacious, sold me a slave last month for the same amount, and he turned out to be an idiot. Too stupid to do anything but shove his finger up his asshole. Had to feed him to my jackals. The slave or Fallacious? Do you really want to know? The gnome asked with a grin, elbowing one of his bodyguards. Max wiped a bit of sweat from his brow, but then quickly put on his salesman face again. Uh, that one was always a bit of a shady character, even in our trade. Me, I pride myself on a satisfied customer. 
though I might not put this fine fellow here in charge of your taxes, I guarantee he can swing a hammer or pickaxe as well as any man. Guarantee, eh? Maximus turned a shade paler at having been caught using the G word, perhaps the most reviled of oaths in the tongue of the traitors. I only meant... But if you're not willing to honor your word, then perhaps I can shop elsewhere. No, Max quickly replied. My word is my bond. This fine fellow is guaranteed. Dingus smiled, revealing several gold teeth. Very well. Three hundred now. But if I'm forced to kill him before the next day of flesh, then I want a full refund. That's a whole month away, and we both know how dangerous a place Kel can be. Uh, let's say fifty back if he's dead by then. Fifty? What kind of guarantee is that? He glanced at the bugbears by his side, who both growled at the merchant. Um, not a very good one, I suppose. How about seventy-five? Dingus took a moment to straighten his silken robes. I would be a fool to accept anything less than two hundred. I have employees to pay, mouths to feed. I can't very well be expected to conduct business on such a slim margin. Dingus glared up at him, and the two men locked eyes for several seconds. Very well, Max said. Half back if you're forced to kill him, but I'll need a full accounting of his fate to show my investors— Deal. Dingus spat into his palm and held it out. Max repeated the gesture and shook the little gnome's hand. Gold was exchanged and a receipt for ownership written up. All the while, Silas stood impassively, looking around and taking in the myriad wonders of the marketplace. By the expression on his face, one might have thought he wasn't aware of his fate. But when the chains binding him were placed into the hands of one of the bugbear guards, he readily stepped forward. Thank you. Max turned to him. Are you talking to me or to your new master? Neither, Silas replied. I was thanking mighty Tuareg for allowing me to be so fortunate as to be put under the stewardship of the fine dwarf you've sold me to. Uh-oh. Max took a step back, panic on his face. Dingus's eyes narrowed. What did you call me? As I said, you are a fine dwarf, Silas said. Even if you are smaller than any I can remember meeting. Why, it is as if you were a mere dwarven child, yet I can tell even now that you are full of the spirit of Tor. I'm a gnome. Max tried to interject. I'm sure he's just confused because, back off, merchant, he's not your concern anymore. Yes. Silas agreed, continuing to address Dingus. Truly, you are a mighty dwarf of the known clan. Dingus screamed an oath and pointed a finger at his new acquisition. The two bugbears immediately fell upon Silas with their fists. Many blows were thrown before his cries, thanking Tuareg, were finally silenced. All the while, Maximus clutched his coin purse, no doubt ruining the guarantee he'd made. Slave of Ideology For the second time in as many days, Silas awoke in a place different from where he'd passed out or been beaten senseless. Unlike the previous day, he wasn't so quick to bounce back to his feet. Dingus's bodyguards were both thorough and enthusiastic when it came to their jobs. They'd laid into the helpless paladin for quite some time, even after he was unconscious. Nevertheless, their beating still wasn't enough to keep Silas from cracking open his bloodied lips and offering thanks to Tuareg. Huh? What was that? Silas managed to open one swollen eye. Looking down at him was a middle-aged man with brown hair and a beard peppered with flecks of gray. He was dressed in a simple but clean tunic and was wringing out a cloth with water, which he then placed upon Silas's brow. Who? Don't try to move or talk, the man replied. If Master Dingus's guards have one talent, it's dishing out discipline. Agreed, 
praise Tuareg for their lesson in humility, and may he bless our dwarven master with... Yeah, about that. Word of advice. Master Dingus is a gnome, not a dwarf. If you're not familiar with their race, I can understand the confusion, but believe me, there's a difference. And in case you're wondering, gnomes really don't like being confused with their larger, more brutish cousins, and the master especially doesn't like it. But I believe you learned that lesson already. Pity. His temper would have fit in well at the shrine. Shrine? The man quickly waved off his question. It doesn't matter. That was your old life. You're here now, and here you will stay for so long as you hold our master's favor. Oh, and in order to hold his favor, you should know that you'll need to hold mine first. Silas raised an eyebrow upon his bruised face, or tried to anyway. My name's Gideon. I am the first among the filth here. My job is to manage the other slaves so our master doesn't have to busy himself with such lowly endeavors. Do as you're told, and do it well, and you will be treated fairly. Or as fairly as can be expected. Perform badly, and you will be punished. That seemed to make Silas smile. Punishment? Yes, punishment. I look forward to it. Well met, Gideon. They call me, it doesn't matter, Gideon said. That was your old name. The master will give you a new one, and henceforth that is what you will be known as. But for now, rest. The master insists that all his new servants be able to move their fingers again before he works them to the bone. Gideon nursed Silas back to health. Between the young warrior's stamina for pain and a few healing brews the chief slave managed to smuggle in, it didn't take long before the would-be paladin was ready for his new life. Wake up, maggot. Silas opened his eyes to find Gideon staring down at him. What time is it? Two hours before sunrise. Thank you for letting me sleep in, Silas said, sitting up. The abbot would have beat me with a wet mop if I wasn't up at least four hours before the sun. But I deserved it, for in the eyes of Tuareg I am nothing but... I'm sure I don't care, Gideon replied. Here, put this on. He handed Silas a dusty gray tunic that looked as if it hadn't been washed in months. Such fine clothes for an unworthy cur such as me. You really are an odd one, maggot. Silas dressed quickly. I'm not odd. I am merely a filthy sinner, a pimple upon the almighty ass of Tuareg, waiting to be popped so that my disgrace may spew... Gideon held up a hand. Fascinating, I'm sure, but we have more pressing matters. The good news is you're healthy enough to get to work. The bad news is that Master Dingus has assigned you to the salt mines, located deep beneath the city. Excellent. Before you rejoice, I have to warn you, the work is excruciating. It's hot and cramped down there. There's pockets of poisonous gas everywhere, and it's been known to flood unexpectedly whenever the tide is high. Oh, and there's only one ladder in and out if that ever happens. Sounds bracing. Gideon blinked several times. Yeah, bracing is one word for it. I'll be perfectly honest with you, it's not known as a place where many survive for long. Yet another test of my unworthiness, for I, Silas, that's another thing, the chief slave interrupted. The master has chosen your new name, too. Hopefully one befitting garbage such as me. What shall I be known as? Exactly what I've been calling you. Silas shrugged and shook his head. Maggot, your name is Maggot. Upon hearing this, Silas clapped his hands together in glee. Thank you, Tuareg, for spitting upon your lowly maggot. Not quite the reaction I usually get, but one does meet all kinds in this work. Okay then, rejoicing time is over. I have matters to attend to, and you have salt to dig. So, how about we get to work? Gideon led Silas out of his cell, and through the dingy back halls of Dingus's opulent estate. Along the way, they passed several other beaten-down-looking slaves. Silas was sure to greet them all with the blessings of Tuareg, even as the vast majority ignored him, 
lest they be a few seconds too slow in performing their duties. At last, Gideon led Silas to the bottommost reaches of the keep. There, the walls were carved from the very bedrock upon which Kel sat. A dour-faced man covered in tattoos awaited them next to a large circular trap door set in the floor. It was open, revealing a hole leading down and the top of a rather rickety ladder. "'Ah, you're here. Good,' Gideon said. "'As if I wouldn't be whipped bloody if I weren't,' the angry-looking man replied. "'True enough. Mangot, this is Slug. He's in charge of the mine slaves and will also be your digging partner. He'll show you the ropes, the best veins to mine, as well as how fast you need to work.' Slug took one look at Silas, then turned and spat. "'Your job will be to dig. Whatever you find, you give to me, and I'll place it into the mine cart. That's how me and my previous partner worked, and that's how things will work with us.' Gideon eyed him. "'Whatever happened to your other partner, by the way? What was his name?' "'Parasite,' Slug replied. "'He dug too slowly.' so I crushed his head with a rock before he could embarrass me further. Ah, yes, Gideon nodded. I remember now. Well, hopefully history doesn't repeat itself. But enough chatter. The master doesn't own an ever-full purse, you know. That salt won't dig itself. Time to get to work. By Tuareg's will, it will be done. Silas started toward the ladder. He'd just reached the top rung when Gideon cleared his throat. Where are you going? to the mine. Aren't you forgetting something? A look of panic crossed Silas's eyes. You're right. He climbed out and then dropped to his knees. Oh, mighty Tuareg, please ensure that my fingers bleed and my back aches so that I might languish in misery as you... I meant your pickaxe. How are you supposed to dig otherwise? Silas looked confused. With my hands, of course. I can't properly suffer if we're going to do this the easy way. Slug spat upon the ground again. Maybe I should crush his head now and save us both the trouble. Planting the Seeds of Chaos Hours turned into days, and the days into weeks. During that time... I watched from afar as Silas toiled ceaselessly in the mines, digging non-stop so that even Slug had to labor to keep up with him. He worked until his hands bled, then scabbed over, then bled some more. All the while, the tunnels echoed with his songs to Tuareg, sung until Silas's throat was so parched with salt that he could sing no more, and even then he continued to try. At first, the other slaves weren't happy with his constant supplication. They'd grumble, complain, and even throw rocks in an attempt to shut him up. None of it worked, except once when Grub Shit, a fellow slave, got lucky and hit Silas in the forehead, knocking him out for almost an hour. Once he woke up again, though, he was ready to belt out more hymns. Eventually, much like a disease will spread through close quarters, his words began to infect the others. It started out with just a few others, subconsciously humming along with the overly zealous new slave, but eventually more and more began to join in. Soon the tunnels echoed with praise for Tuareg, and that praise would only grow louder with each cave-in, flood, or other horrendous accident. Word reached Dingus's ears that his mining slaves were acting oddly upbeat as of late, but he didn't care because their productivity was up by nearly twenty percent. So long as the salt flowed from the mines and gold stacked up in his vault, he wasn't particularly concerned whether his minions passed the hours singing out-of-tune songs to some foreign god. The only one who seemed to care was Slug. The pitmaster had taken an instant dislike to Silas from the moment he'd laid eyes on him. As the weeks wore on, he grew more and more resentful. I didn't know whether it was the constant singing slowly driving him mad, or the fact that, 
In time, nearly all of the slaves toiling in the mine joined in. But as Silas continued, Slug began to look longingly at the sharpest and heaviest rocks, no doubt entertaining memories of his previous partner's fate. "'We're working here today,' Slug stopped in the middle of the busiest tunnel of the mine. A thin layer of salt coated him, the mine cart, and nearly everything else in sight. Silas, for his part, seemed disappointed. "'I was hoping we'd go deep today, maybe down that new shaft we've been digging. It's hotter than the abyss in there.' "'Wonderful, isn't it?' Silas replied, with a salt-encrusted grin. The heat roasting my lungs and the sweat stinging my eyes. It all serves to remind me how close to damnation I would be if not for the disgust of Tuareg. A chorus of, Praise Tuareg! rose up among the other slaves present. Enough of that! Slug shouted, a vein visibly throbbing on his tattooed forehead. He looked around and eyed the other diggers, disgust plainly evident on his face. After a moment, it appeared that he had come to a conclusion of sorts. Listen up, and listen well. From here on in, I say this ends. There will be no more talk of this false god. Grumbles rose up from the others, but Slug wasn't finished yet. Stop and think for a minute, you soft-headed fools. Has Tuareg done anything for you? Has he made your tools lighter of the rock softer? Has he made the hours of your labour shorter? No. So why bother singing his praises? Instead of getting angry, Silas actually laughed. Tuareg does none of that. He's not some weak god. He doesn't hand out fish to the hungry masses or sneak into our houses while we sleep to leave presents in our stockings. No. Tuareg's greatest gift is his disdain. He offers us no pity or quarter. If I were to approach him parched and begging for a sip of water, he would drown me in his spittle. If I were starving and asked for bread, he would sit his lordly ass on my face so that I might feast upon the only loaf I am worthy of. All eyes in the mine were firmly locked on Silas, albeit many of them appeared confused as to what his point was. And do you know why? Silas continued. Because it makes us strong. The louder we scream for his mercy, the more burdens he drops onto our shoulders until we have a choice to be crushed like bugs or thank him and ask for more weight. The other slaves turned and looked at one another for several long seconds, until finally they all screamed out in unison, Thank you, Tuareg! Oh, said that enough! Slug grabbed Silas by his tunic, spun him around, and slugged him in the jaw. The zealous warrior turned over enthusiastic slave hit the ground with a heavy thud and lay unmoving for several seconds. But then he sat up, his lips freely bleeding, and pulled himself back to his feet. Thank you, brother. What? For reminding me that my words are mere pathetic ramblings. For indeed, if I spoke them to Tuareg, he would gladly punch out my teeth, magically heal them, then punch them out again. I told you to shut up! Slug kicked Silas in the gut, doubling him over. But again, Silas was not so easily dismayed. Next time, hit me lower, for there is no love quite like the feel of Tuareg's steeled boots crushing one's crotch into paste. Slug began to pummel Silas in earnest, all while the other slaves gathered around and watched. But the young warrior refused to be bowed, rising and praising Tuareg despite each new bruise or contusion that appeared on his body. Blood flew, staining the white salt of the cave walls, but still Silas continued to sing his praises. Eventually, Slug's blows became less frenzied, and he began to breathe hard. But Silas continued to stand his ground and take the beating until, at last, the other man was clearly exhausted by his efforts. 
do you see now, my friend? Silas asked, one eye blackened and blood dripping from half a dozen minor cuts. When one gives their heart to Tuareg, there is no amount of pain that doesn't feel wonderful. Slug was gasping for breath, but he still screwed up his face in contempt. You're foul of shit, and your gold is too. He let fly one last time, striking Silas contemptuously across the face. Indeed, I am full of so much shit it stains my soul. Gah! How are you still standing? I don't understand it. Silas grinned, showing cracked teeth. I will show you, brother. Show me what? How to bleed like a... Slug's question was interrupted by a fist to his mouth. The pitmaster fell back against the minecart, catching the edge so as to keep himself from hitting the floor. With a growl, he pushed himself off and rushed Silas, but the earnest paladin was ready for him. He raised a knee, catching Slug in the midsection and knocking the wind out of him. Slug hit the salt-encrusted floor, and Silas straddled him, punching him in the mouth again. Blood began to run freely from the side of Slug's split lips, but the young warrior wasn't finished. "'Fear not, brother,' Silas proclaimed, "'for I shall teach you the love of Tuareg as it was once taught to me.' A chorus of voices immediately rose up around them. "'Praise Tuareg!' Silas smiled, then reached down and rubbed his hands in a mound of salt dust before proceeding to strike Slug again, each blow accompanied by the frenzied shouts of the other slaves. Though it's debatable whether it was Silas's intent or desire, by beating the love of Tuareg into Slug, he inadvertently found himself named the new pitmaster of Dingus Glitterfinger's salt mines, a promotion only possible through force and strength of arms. At first, he appeared confused by his new station, not seeming to understand why the others started coming to him for their assignments. However, he seemed pleased once he learned that his new place in the slave hierarchy afforded him the benefit of having to work even harder. Within a short time, he simply accepted the fact and told the other slaves to keep doing what they had been, digging salt and screaming the praises of Tuareg while they worked their fingers until they bled. One morning, several days later, Silas awoke early, looking forward to another day of back-breaking labor as his lungs slowly filled with salt dust. He was just about ready to leave for the mine when Gideon appeared at the door of his cell. The chief slave held up a hand when Silas attempted to step past him. No digging today, maggot. Silas visibly brightened at the news. I see. So what will it be, then? Am I to be whipped for my insolence? Perhaps branded with hot pokers? No, Gideon replied, looking somewhat confused. If anything, Master Dingus is pleased at the output from the mines. In fact, I believe this is the first time in recent memory when he hasn't constantly threatened to have you all buried alive if you didn't dig faster. Pity. Um, yes, quite the pity, I'm sure. Now, if you're through giving me torture tips to share with our master, I'm here to lead you and your men to the temple. The temple? Of course. Today is Lord's Day, after all. Every day is dedicated to my Lord Twa- Yes, yes, I know. Believe me, we all do. Your singing is so loud down below that we can even hear it in the kitchens. I'm surprised the staff up here hasn't gone mad yet. But that's not what I meant. It's Lord's Day, as in the day of the week. Silas shrugged, apparently not comprehending. Every Lord's Day we give thanks. Our gracious master allows us to take a third of the day off from our labors. Silas clapped his hands together. Truly he is generous. Wait, if this happens every Lord's Day, then what about all the other weeks? Gideon smiled sheepishly. Sorry about that, but sometimes we forget about you mine rats. I'm sure you can understand how it is with my position. It's so hard to keep track of everyone. Silas was quick to nod. 
No worries, my friend. Back at the shrine it was considered heresy to cease laboring. If anything, I was expected to work twice as hard on our Lord's holidays. A fascinating life you led prior to coming here, Gideon replied, obviously impatient to get moving. You must tell me about it sometime, but enough of that for now. The mention of your multiple weeks of non-stop labor has reminded me of the real reason for fetching you this day. On Lord's Day, slaves are marched to the temple where we are blessed and healed by the clerics there, but most importantly, he added with a wrinkle of his nose, we are bathed. Shoddy Heresy The numerous slaves serving Dingus Glitterfinger's estate were marched in chains to the temple of Loradane, the mistress of the downtrodden. A massive marble relief of the goddess stood outside, her arms opened as if welcoming everyone, no matter of their status. However, despite this comfortable facade, the slaves were still led in through a back door. "'What is this place?' Silas asked Slug, who was marching solemnly beside him. A shrine to some heretical goddess of wealth? Are you kidding me? He replied. Everyone knows Laura Dane. Never heard of her. Well, you will, for within her walls we are allowed a few small comforts that our life of misery affords us. Fair, <laughs> comfort is sinful. Look, maggot, she's the goddess of hope and salvation. It's simple. We come here to have our wounds healed, the muck scraped off our bodies, and to give thanks for her blessings. And our masters too, Gideon said, stepping up and joining the two men. Let us not forget to give praise to Master Dingus for his generosity in allowing us these few short hours of rest, in which we contribute nothing to society. Silas was silent as they entered the halls of Loradane. Inside, he saw reliefs, presumably of the goddess, in the midst of various labors of mercy. Stained glass windows depicted her washing the feet of strangers, healing their injuries, and comforting them as they lay dying. The room they were led into was filled with steaming baths, most of them already full of slaves. So packed in were they, the water in which they bathed had already turned brown from the collective dirt washed off their bodies. White-robed acolytes raced back and forth among the masses. Some provided towels to the bathers. Others offered healing ointments. Still, more led throngs of slaves toward pews aligned before another massive depiction of the goddess. There, a cleric led a group already kneeling in prayer. On one side of the statue hung a large portrait of Dingus, but on the other side was a different painting, one depicting a red-skinned man with dark horns curling around his head. "'So, where shall we start?' Slug asked. "'A bath, maybe, before the water turns completely black. Or maybe a portion to make my knuckles finally stop aching.' "'I would recommend the supplication myself.' Gideon pointed toward the cleric addressing the assembled slaves. And may Laura Dane bless your master Dingus Glitterfinger in allowing the lowest of the low this moment so they might give thanks for his mercy in all things. Silas continued to watch all of this in silence, a perplexed look upon his brow. But then his eyes fell upon the portrait on the opposite side of Dingus's. They're worshipping a demon? Huh? Gideon replied. Oh, him? No, that's his lordship, Rex Telegar. He's the supreme ruler of Kel, and the ruler of Kel is a demon? No, no, he's an infernling. There, a priestess of Loradane interrupted them. Hail there, slaves. May I rub your sore shoulders a bit before you return to your labors? What for? Silas asked his attention pulled from the demonic image of the painting. I have oils and herbs to soothe even the most painful of aches. Fair, just tell me when the beatings will begin, Silas replied offhandedly, trying to look past her at the portrait again. Excuse me? Silas narrowed his eyes at her. 
After you have taken away my pain, you will then return it to me threefold, yes? The priestess looked aghast. Why would I do that? Because that is the one true path of salvation. That is the way of Tuareg. I know not this path, she said. Look around, slave. Do you see anyone being beaten here, being whipped? No, I do not, Silas replied with gritted teeth. "'Tis shoddy heresy indeed. "'Heresy? "'We offer comfort and succor here. "'All are welcome to lies. "'What?' "'Silas shoved her away. "'I said you offer lies. "'Away from me, blasphemous whore. "'Do you think I'm stupid enough to be fooled by your devilry?' "'Gideon stepped between them. "'Is everything okay here, maggot? "'No, it is not okay. "'This is a temple of lies and deceit.' Deceit. Did you inhale too much salt dust or something? Silas turned to him, a strange look in his eye. For once, he wasn't smiling. As a matter of fact, I did. I breathe deep of the poisons every time I am there, for I find the burning in my lungs stimulating. Each new cut in my flesh revitalizes my spirit. Silas turned to slug before he could wander off toward the baths. And whenever a friend smashes my face in, it inspires me. You may want to keep your voice down, Gideon warned. No, screaming the praises of Tuareg moves my soul, not to greatness, but to the best a lowly worm such as myself can aspire to. By then, Silas's voice had risen high enough that he'd caught the attention of several slaves in the room, including some of those who worked in the mines with him. "'Praise Tuareg!' a small group replied. "'Don't encourage him!' Gideon snapped. But he was too late. Silas stepped toward the center of the room and bellowed out, "'Hear me, my fellow filth! What does this so-called goddess do for you? She heals your cuts, rubs your bruises, bathes the encrusted grime off your unworthy bodies, and you do it again and again every week!' They say she is a goddess of hope and salvation, but the only hope I see here is the hope of keeping you weak. Maggot, Gideon implored. Please stop. This is not the... Slug pulled the chief slave away. Let him speak. I want to hear what he has to say. What the fuck's going on over there? Both slaves turned to find a temple guard approaching. He was a brutish fellow wearing leather armor adorned with the symbol of Loredane, two angel wings fluttering in the breeze. He wore a sword at his side and had a bow strapped across his back. The temple of a healer god this might be, but it was still in a city run by slavers, and this man had the look of someone who enjoyed kicking the downtrodden. Nothing, sir, Gideon replied. My friend there is simply overworked. He's from the pit. You know how they get. Well, you better shut him up before I shut you all up. For good. Silas, however, appeared to be just getting started. He raised his voice again. I say you should worship Tuareg. Who? One of the slaves stuffed in the baths cried out. Tuareg, Silas replied, stepping up onto a stone bench so as to make himself heard. He should be your lord, for though he is a dwarf, he stands tall above all others. This Loredane is but a disappointing servant to him, to be slapped in the face whenever it amuses Tuareg. A few chuckles could be heard among the assembled masses. Listen and listen well, for Tuareg is a god of strength. He won't heal your cuts, he'll pour salt in them. He won't rub your bruises. He'll backhand you until your jaw lies in pieces on the floor. Tuareg won't bathe you. He'll piss down your throat and then laugh as you drown in it. That's Tuareg. You can never earn his love, but you will grow powerful trying. The guard who'd been questioning Gideon turned and approached Silas. Okay, that's enough, buddy. Lay off the mind fumes for a while. I'm not finished. Yes, you are. You need to get off there and shut up about your loser god before I cut your stupid tongue out of your fucking head. You're upsetting the other slaves. 
Loser God. Yeah, the guard said. You heard me. Newsflash, genius. You're nothing but a piece of shit. Ergo, any god you worship must be nothing but a fucking oof! Silas kicked the guard in the chest. Blasphemer, silence your bedeviled tongue. All right, that's it. I hope Doreg has a nice spot in hell picked out for you. The guard drew his sword and rushed at Silas. The young warrior narrowly dodged the blow and stepped down to the floor, jumping back as the guard swung the blade again. Though neither combatant appeared to be focused on anything but their opponent, all eyes within the temple were quickly converging upon them. Stay still so I can run you through. Silas held up his hands. You can still throw down your sword and repent. Like hell, troublemaker. Trouble? I simply wished to educate these people in the true path. The guard raised his sword, intending to cleave Silas in two. The only path you're following is the one to the graveyard. He brought his arms down, but Silas stepped in and caught him by the wrists. The two began to wrestle for control of the weapon. You are so dead, the guard spat. Once I finish you off, I'm going to figure out who your friends are and kill them too as a lesson to the rest. What? You heard me. He shoved Silas away sending him tumbling over the bench he'd been standing on a few minutes earlier. Recognition flashed in the guard's eyes, and he smiled. Now that I think of it, I'm pretty sure I've heard of this Tuareg. His symbol's an upside-down hammer, isn't it? Yeah, it is. He began to once more stalk Silas. Kind of looks like a cock and balls, if you ask me. Yeah. I think after I kill you, I'm going to find one of his symbols and use it to fuck your mother. He raised the blade again and charged. You would dare solely a symbol of Tuareg in such a way? Silas bellowed, moving to again dodge the somewhat clumsy strike. Silas stepped in, but before he or the guard could make another move, a dim halo of yellowish light began to emanate from the young zealot's body. Both men seemed surprised to see this, but Silas was apparently in too much of a righteous rage to care. He swung a fist and connected solidly with the guard's face. The glow around him sparked as he made contact, sending teeth flying and putting the other man flat on his back. Silas wasted no time in wrenching the long sword out of his opponent's grasp. He stood above the prone guard and pointed the blade at him. Whispers and murmurs began to rise up all around them. He, he defeated a guard. What's that glow around him? Did someone shove a torch up his ass? No, I've seen that before. It's a divine aura. He's a, a paladin. A paladin slave? That's absurd. It's true. It has to be. Before the whispers could get much louder, the guard held up his hands in supplication. Please spare me. Silas began to lower the blade, but then the guard added, I, I beg Tuareg for mercy. As you wish, my friend, Silas replied, lifting the weapon high. I grant you the only mercy that Tuareg shows to sinners like you. A Revolting Development People die every day, whether it's of old age, sickness, being killed on the road by brigands, or any of a thousand different ways. Most of those deaths don't resonate very far, a life snuffed out with little to commemorate the moment. But some deaths are a catalyst, a torch thrown into a barn filled to the brim with dry hay. Silas Kane dispatched the guard who'd threatened his friends and... More importantly, to the overzealous paladin, mocked his god. The man's death itself was nothing spectacular. A quick wheeze of breath, followed by the normal twitching as his spirit received the message that it was time to close up shop and move on. But as Silas bent down and took the man's bow and quiver, the tinder that he'd struck began to rise up into a mighty flame. You... you killed him! 
a slave with an apparent gift for the obvious, said. I showed him mercy, Silas corrected. Even now Tuareg is shoving this unbeliever's soul up his godly ass, so he may stew forever in his holy colon, for it is written in the one true book of Tuareg, Slug shouted, drowning him out. Prize Tuareg! He repeated the phrase until more and more voices rose up and echoed him. As the chorus grew, several more guards rushed to the aid of their fallen comrade. They never made it. It is doubtful whether Silas knew what he was unleashing, but at that moment he stood up tall and raised the bow into the air. Yes, all the glory to Tuareg. It was as if he pulled the linchpin from a catapult. At his words, at least a dozen of the slaves who'd witnessed his defiance fell upon the guards. More soon joined in. Within short order, the defenders of the temple were felled and their weapons stripped from their bodies. Clerics of Laura Dane raced in to help quell the riot which had seemingly started from out of nowhere, but most of their spells were geared toward healing. A few offensive incantations they possessed were more aimed at stunning than killing. Soon enough, their corpses were piled with the guards, and the sound of their maces could be heard as they were used to smash apart the chains still binding many of the slaves. Silas, for his part, stripped the dead guard of his leather armor, then carved a crude depiction of a hammer over the symbol of Loradane before donning it. Ah, much better. Yes, arming yourself for the battle to come, Slug said. A wise move. Huh? Silas asked. It's not that. My tunic is soft and comfortable. I prefer the feel of leather chafing against my tender flesh. Ah, the discomfort of my nether regions after a long day of rubbing against armor is a true blessing to behold. Before Slug could properly process this, Gideon pushed his way through the throng of slaves. What have you done, maggot? Slug immediately got into his face. What has he done? He's shown us a new path. His voice rose, addressing the crowd. A new chapter begins in our lives, one filled with hope and freedom, one filled with the might of Tuareg, and we have Maggot to thank for showing us the way. A chant of Maggot began to rise up in the temple. Wait! Slug roared, eyeing Gideon. Maggot is his slave name, the name given by our overseers. He turned to Silas. Tell us, what should we call you? Silas shrugged. I like being called Maggot, for it is all I am in the eyes of Tuareg. But surely you had a name before coming to this God's forsaken place? True, the dwarves at the shrine named me Silas Kane, but I much prefer Ma- All hail Silas Kane! Slug cried, his voice echoing in the temple. Paladin of Tuareg and smasher of chains! Any protests Silas might have had were buried beneath an avalanche of voices shouting his name. If anything, he looked far more perplexed than inspired, but that didn't seem to matter to those around him. Finally, when it died down enough, he said, Do not praise me. Look to Tuareg for your guidance, for he will show you the path. And where will that path take us next? Grub Shit asked from the crowd. Um, home, I guess. Silas replied. There's still much work left to be done this day. Slug clapped Silas on the back. You heard the man. The first place we take is the home of our so-called master. Death to Dingus! Judging by the confused look on Silas's face, it was dubious as to whether that was actually what he'd meant, but by then it was too late. The slaves were already raising their fists into the air and promising that Dingus Glitterfinger would be the first of many to come. Three quarters of the temple slaves rushed back toward Dingus's estate, moving quickly before the city guards grew wise to their plans. The rest headed toward the other great houses of Kel to tell their fellow servants of what had happened and to induct more of them into the uprising which was slowly forming. It had been a long time since Kell had experienced a slave revolt of any significance. Yes, there were the occasional protests, 
and every now and then a minor noble had their throat cut in their sleep, but these were often isolated incidents which were always put down quickly before they could spread. If anything, the high lords of Kell, of which Dingus Glitterfinger was one, felt secure in their power, as they were practically city-states in their own right, administering swift and brutal justice as was needed to keep their slaves in line. Because of this arrogance, the trio of bugbears guarding the rear entrance to Dingus's lower estate thought little of the swarm of slaves rapidly approaching. It wasn't until it was too late that they realized some of the slaves were armed and were all free of the chains they usually wore. Though the guards managed to fell a good half-dozen, thanks to their size and strength, they were overrun before they could raise an alarm. Dingus's estate was large and well fortified, so the screams of the guards went unnoticed, even as their weapons were pulled from their dying hands. Even if they had been heard, though, it's unlikely much would have been done. Cries of pain weren't exactly uncommon in Kell, albeit it was usually the slaves, not their overseers, doing the screaming. As other servants were encountered, they were offered the choice of joining the rebellion. Some, no doubt terrified by the throng of maniacs crying Tuareg's name, fled. But many more joined in, seeing hope, a rare thing in itself, shining in their fellow slaves' eyes. Soon they too were crying the name of a god most of them had never heard of before that day. By the time word reached Dingus, who'd been otherwise occupied using his glitter fingers on one of his favorite concubines, nearly half his compound had been overrun. By the time he took it seriously, all avenues of escape were cut off. Despite his small size, the slave master wasn't an easy mark. Though he'd long since retired to a life of hedonistic cruelty, once upon a time he'd been a wizard for hire, a mercenary known for his sharp mind and quick spells. Alas, time and inactivity can turn even the most stalwart warrior into little more than a junior adventurer. As the first wave of rebelling slaves attempted to breach his inner chambers, Dingus called upon his eldritch powers, unused in years, and flung an orb of brightly colored flame directly into the midst of battle where his mightiest guards were attempting to hold back the angry mob. The fireball exploded in a brilliant sphere of red-hot energy, instantly vaporizing five slaves at the vanguard of the assault. Unfortunately, his aim was off, for he also ended up stunning the very guards who'd formed a bottleneck into his chambers. A few minutes, and several wasted magic missiles later, multiple bodies lay on the floor from both sides of the struggle. Dingus himself was dragged from his bedroom screaming a litany of curses, all of which fell on deaf ears, partially because of the sonic boom spell he'd used right before his capture. The former slave master was carried to the second-floor balcony where Slug, Gideon, and Silas awaited. A mass of freed slaves stood on the floor below cheering them on, despite Silas's protests that they only cheer for Tuareg. Dingus was flung to the floor before them and forced onto his knees. Slug stepped up and spat upon him. How the mighty have fallen! You would dare put yourself above me? Dingus cried angrily. I am your master! Slug responded by lifting a broken chair leg above his head. But I am not entirely averse to the concept of discussing an emancipation plan. Too late, dog. I'm going to enjoy... Wait! Gideon cried. Do we really want to sink to his level? I would need to cut off my own legs to sink to his level. I meant we should prove that we're better than him. Am I right, Silas? Silas looked up from where he was busy carving the symbol of Tuareg into the back of his hand with an arrowhead. In the eyes of Tuareg, we are all despicable scum. Perhaps, Gideon replied cautiously, but certainly some scum are worse than others. The paladin appeared to consider this for a moment, then he shrugged. I suppose. I've never really thought much about it. Oh, really? Gideon narrowed his eyes. If 
Tuareg was truly wise, he would differentiate between them, wouldn't he? Tuareg is indeed wise, Silas cried in near panic. He acknowledges infinite layers of scum. The slaves on the floor below screamed out Tuareg's name in response. Gideon nodded and turned back toward Slug. There, now that we've settled that. Slug crossed his arms in front of him. And what exactly was your point with that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But I don't think we should outright kill him. Both of the former slaves turned to face Silas. What say you? Gideon asked. You're the deciding vote. Live or die, Slug added, his weapon still at the ready. Silas stopped carving again and glanced their way. Well, Tuareg hates the weak, but then he also hates the strong. In fact, Tuareg hates everyone except his chosen people, even if our former master is small for a dwarf. I'm not a dwarf, you filthy shitheaded. Dingus seemed to realize what he was saying, because he quickly amended it. What I meant to say was, of course I'm a dwarf. I'm just undercover, trying to infiltrate the anti-dwarf conspiracy. Do you truly think we are that stupid? I knew it, Silas said, interrupting Slug. No wonder you were so excellent in choosing my daily labors. Why, my fingers haven't bled that hard in years. Truly a wonderful experience. Um, you're welcome. So, then you admit to being one of Tuareg's chosen? Sure, why not? Dingus replied, grinning the smile of a rat who's discovered a way out of the trap he's found himself in. Hail Tuareg! Yes, Silas shouted. Hail Tuareg! He turned to the other two. Release him. But, I said release him. He's a true believer and no enemy of ours. Gideon immediately stepped back, but Slug looked reluctant to allow their former master any quarter. You heard him, Dingus said, his former arrogance back. I'm a true believer. You're a liar. And as a true believer, I demand Tuareg's mercy. What was that? Silas asked, turning back to him. I said I demand our mighty lord's mercy. Silas clapped his hands together in joy. Spectacular! He walked over to Dingus and picked up the gnome by the back of his robes. Wait, what are you doing? Silas carried him over to the balcony overlooking the masses below. As you requested. He held the gnome over the edge. What is this? Dingus demanded. Tuareg's mercy, of course, Silas replied. But as a true believer, you must already know that Tuareg shows none. He expects his followers to be strong and utterly destroy their foes. What? Your request is granted, my friend. May Tuareg grant you the strength to find your own mercy. With that, Silas dropped Dingus to the floor below. The gnome landed hard on the polished tile floor, the snap of bones clearly heard above his screams. Within seconds... The crowd of rebelling slaves descended upon their former master and tore him limb from limb. Silas watched all of this from above, with a thoughtful look upon his face. "'What did you do?' Gideon asked, as he and Slug stepped to either side of him to view the carnage below. After several minutes, Silas looked up and faced him. "'I begin to suspect that perhaps his faith wasn't as strong as he claimed.' He turned and began to walk away. That and he was awfully small, even for a dwarf. Burning Desire Over the course of the next several days, the slave revolt spread like a cleansing fire from house to house. It didn't matter whether the masters closed their gates or forced their servants to the deepest parts of their compounds. Word of the rebellion still reached them. As the word spread, so too did the name of the one who started that fire, Silas Cain. This was despite the fact that Silas was seldom seen on the front lines. Slug became the self-appointed general of the revolt in his absence, directing slaves to ransack storage catches for weapons and food. Silas, for his part, was far more focused on spreading the word of Tuareg than anything else. 
leading the most zealous of his new converts, he focused on the shrines and temples of Loredane, looting, pillaging, and defiling them, regardless of whether they had any strategic value to the revolt or not. In his wake he left crude symbols of Tuareg etched in the walls and painted on the robes of any priests caught unaware and quickly inducted into the ranks of this strange new religion they'd never heard of. As Silas worked tirelessly to erase a mostly benign religion from Kel, Slug pressed ever forward, eventually attracting the support of the underclass of the city, free men and women who lived in the poorest slums. Soon the city guard was forced to act, but by then the largest houses in Kel were in open revolt. Slave masters were thrown from the highest parapets of their former domains, and their homes declared sanctuaries of Tuareg. Only one man on the side of the rebels seemed interested in the concept of restraint, but for the most part his entreaties fell upon deaf ears. You shouldn't have hanged him, Gideon implored, from deep inside Dingus Glitterfinger's former compound, now renamed the Free Union of Crusading Knights Indebted to Tuareg. Slug laughed. Why not? He was one of the masters. He was already dead. You'd torn off his arms, burnt him alive, and then had him flayed. He turned to where Silas was busy, instructing a group of ragged-looking men in the proper methods of self-flagellation. And be sure the leather of the whip is salted first, because that will ensure you feel the sting of Tuareg's disdain. Surely you can talk some sense into him, Silas. The paladin turned to the former chief slave. Excuse me? Slug, Gideon explained. Don't you think he's going too far with this? We wanted to send a message, not drown the streets in blood, and... He trailed off as he watched Slug put something around his neck. Dear gods, what is that? Slug smiled down at the necklace of fingers he'd adorned himself with. Spoils of war. This one is from Dingus. This pinky belonged to Robert the Fatuous. I cut this thumb off of Irina the... How dare you! Silas roared, stalking over. Gideon smiled. Finally, some common sense. Silas walked up to Slug, a furious look upon his face. He grabbed hold of the vile necklace, then moved it slightly to the side, exposing the upside-down hammer carved into Slug's breastplate. Never cover up a symbol of Tuareg. It's disrespectful. Disrespectful? Gideon cried. He's wearing a fucking necklace made of fingers. Silas merely shrugged. I don't recall seeing that listed as a sin. He pointed toward the necklace. Just don't enjoy it too much. Of course not, mighty Silas Kane. My life is given to suffering for the glory of Tuareg. Excellent. Carry on. Silas turned back toward the slaves, whipping themselves into a frenzy. You call that bleeding? That won't even leave a scar. You can't keep ransacking the temples, Silas. They give people hope. Hope in a false god is no hope at all. Yes, but they're neutral. They've been taking in casualties from both sides. And that is why they should be stopped, Silas said, pounding a fist onto the table, also adorned with an upside-down hammer, like nearly everything else in the ill-named compound. I would sooner be boiled alive by a true believer than have even a paper cut tended to by a minion of the deceiver. Laura Dane isn't a deceiver, Gideon implored. Her followers worship her, yes? True. And they don't worship Tuareg, right? Also true. Ha! Huh, Silas proclaimed. Then that is the deception right there for a lesser god of any worth would surely direct their followers to drop to their knees before Tuareg. That makes no fucking sense. Worshipping Tuareg isn't supposed to make sense. That's what makes it so glorious. Gideon seemed to be at a loss for a comeback, but at that moment Slug entered the war chamber. He was flanked by several former slaves turned guards, all of them wearing makeshift armor adorned with an upside-down hammer. He walked toward his two fellow leaders in the revolt and held out a scroll. A messenger was sent from the high castle. He had this with him. What did he say? Very little after we cut out his tongue. Gideon slapped a hand to his forehead, then took a deep breath. 
Fine. What does the scroll say? No idea. I can't read. He handed it to Silas, who unfurled it, looked at it for several seconds, then crumbled it up and tossed it into the nearby fire pit. Fair. I see no parables to Tuareg on that. Oh, for the love of the gods! Gideon grabbed the scroll before it could burn up and took a look. It's not a prayer book to Tuareg, hence why I burned it. Gideon narrowed his eyes at the two, then went back to reading the scroll. This is a direct entreaty from Rex Telegar. Who? Silas idly asked, dancing his hand over the flames of the fire pit. He's the high magistrate of Kel. Silas looked up from where his fingers were starting to sizzle. Wait, you mean the infernal demon who casts his unholy shadow upon this place? No, Gideon replied. He's the duly appointed ruler of this city, and he's not a demon, he's an infernling. And those are? They're a race of humanoids, mostly from the south where it's warm, Slug said. Exactly, Gideon agreed. They're merely another race, no different from any other intelligent. It also said their ancestors cavorted with creatures from the pit. What? Silas roared. Gideon's eyes opened in panic. He held up his hands in supplication. It's not like that. It was in the distant past, eons ago. So? So, it's like, er, worm kind. You've seen them around, right? No. Of course you have. Milo is one of them. He pointed to one of Slug's guards, a large reptilian humanoid covered in greenish scales. Hmm. I just thought he was extra skilled at beating himself and was covered in festering wounds. Why does that not surprise me? Gideon sighed. But anyway, my point is that his ancestors mated with dragons. So now some of their descendants still have wings or tails, but it doesn't make them actual dragons. How does one mate with a dragon? Slug asked. Gideon's face went blank. Um, I have no idea. But that doesn't matter. Infernlings are no more demons than wormkind or dragons. Silas narrowed his eyes. But they have demon blood in their veins, yes? Technically, but it's not their fault. They were just born that way. They didn't ask to have red skin and horns. Neither did I, Silas boomed. Not that I have either. What I mean is I didn't ask to be born a human. If given the choice, surely I would have been birthed as one of Tuareg's chosen. But I wasn't. And now I carry the eternal sin of my parents' fornication within me. You can't blame your parents. Of course I can. Tuareg does, and he makes it known to me every night in my dreams while he repeatedly rips off my arms and beats me with them for the sin of my failure. Makes sense to me, Slug said. Tuareg hates us for being human, so wouldn't he hate someone with demon blood even more? Gideon's mouth dropped open. No, think about this real hard, Silas. I am, and it sounds to me like Tuareg demands we remove this creature's stain from upon the world so that he might despise us slightly less. That's not what I meant. You were born a human, so Tuareg considers you inferior, right? Of course, and praise him for it every— Yeah, yeah, we all know that. What I meant is that in order to win Tuareg's favor, you have to work that much harder, correct? One as lowly as me can never win Tuareg's— Gideon held up a hand. I get it. I meant in order for Tuareg to hate you less. Silas nodded emphatically. Yes, because of the stain of my lineage, Tuareg demands I suffer. He will accept nothing less. Prize Tuareg, Slug shouted, which led to the others in the room doing the same. Five minutes later, once the praising had died down, Gideon was able to speak again. Well, then if you have to work that much harder to appease Tuareg, how hard do even more vile creatures have to work? Silas raised an eyebrow. I don't understand. Think about it. I mean, truly, think. What if a demon wanted to change its ways? How would they do that? 
they'd find a true warrior of Tuareg and die by their hand. But what if they thought they could do more good by living? What if they wanted to repent and dedicate their life to helping people, uh, I mean, toward serving Tuareg's will? Tuareg would demand their blood, sweat, and tears. A lot of tears. That's exactly what I mean, Gideon implored. This scroll says that Rex wants to meet with the leaders of the rebellion to discuss peace. He doesn't want to see any more bloodshed. He wants to find a solution that we can all come to terms with and doesn't leave the city a smoldering ruin. At Silas's blank look, he continued, I believe he's finally beginning to understand the wisdom of Tuareg. Perhaps he's trying to repent, and this is his first step. It could be a trap, Slug offered. Could be, Gideon echoed. Or he could be trying to do what's right. Rex is known for being level-headed and approachable. Cruel but fair. I think he's trying to do what's best for this city, which, right now, means listening to what we have to say. But what about Tuareg? Silas asked. Gideon let out a pained sigh. What would Tuareg want more? A dead demon or another servant to beat himself senseless while screaming his name? Is this a trick question? I think Tuareg would want the latter. Don't we owe it to him to give Rex a chance? We could bring peace back to Kel, maybe improve everyone's lives a little while we're at it. But they would all still whip themselves for Tuareg, right? Yes, they would all still whip themselves for Tuareg, Gideon replied, deadpan. Then I say we see what this filthy demon has to offer, and may Tuareg look down and smile, knowing that one day he will be able to flay the skin from all our wretched hides. A Meeting of the Mindless a temporary ceasefire was called in the civil war gripping Kell, a chance for both sides to tend to their wounded, mourn their dead, and dig in with their defenses. It was made known that Rex Telegar, High Magistrate of Kell, against the wishes of his advisers, was seeking to meet with the leaders of the rebellion so as to find a peaceful solution. As a show of good faith for this meeting, the city's standing army, backed by fresh troops from the kingdom, was ordered to hold fast outside the city's walls. Within the city itself, the mood was tense but hopeful. The masses of former slaves held on to the dream of a better life, one in which they were not merely fodder for the wealthy and powerful. On the other side, the high lords of Kel wished to see their beloved city continue to stand tall, preferably with their livelihoods left intact. Both factions understood what the other wanted and what that potentially meant for each other, but there was hope nevertheless that perhaps some middle ground could be reached before Kell was reduced to rubble. Despite Silas being the public face of the rebellion, Gideon took the lead in negotiating a time and place for the peace summit. It was understood that he, as a former chief servant, knew the most about diplomacy, and was likewise the only one among their number who had even a passing interest in how it worked. Messengers raced back and forth between the two warring factions, and at last an agreement was reached that would allow them to sit down and try to hammer out their differences. Neutral ground was chosen, a small temple dedicated to the dueling gods. It had been abandoned as the rebellion spread and now sat unoccupied. It was also not lost upon either side that the nature of the two deities seemed fitting for the struggle currently threatening to consume Kel. However, to account for the specific quirks of at least one of the rebellion's leaders, all statues, fetishes, and depictions of the gods were either removed or covered for the purposes of the summit. The leadership of both contingents would be allowed in, three from each side, along with a small honor guard of armed escorts just in case the talks broke down. As the day of the summit dawned, Silas, Gideon, and Slug made their way to the temple with a ragtag group of former slaves flanking them. "'Today is a good day, friends,' Silas proclaimed. Slug grunted in acknowledgment, but Gideon merely groused. 
I hope so. It is, for today marks a new beginning for Kel, one in which slavery is abolished and all men are free. Yes, free to worship Tuareg. That is one aspect of freedom, I suppose, Gideon replied. But what if they choose to worship something else? There is no one else, for all false gods shall be driven from this city. People will be free to praise Tuareg or die as heretics. I'm not sure that's entirely the point of, we shouldn't even be wasting our time with this, Slug said. Telegar will be there in the flesh. We should have our people strike the temple, make sure he doesn't escape. Once he's dead, the opposition will crumble, and Kill will be ours. We'll string up the old masters from the walls and declare ourselves an independent city-state. Gideon gave him the side eye. That's not really why we're here, either. Slug turned to Silas. I have an idea. You paladins are supposed to be able to sense evil in the hearts of men and beasts. Why don't you concentrate on doing that during the meeting? Focus on those dogs seated at the other side of the table. If you sense any deceit, then we strike first. Good idea, Silas said. He closed his eyes for a moment, then cried out, I sense wickedness everywhere. No, not now, when they... Gideon sighed heavily. There will be no deceit. Both sides want to end the killing in a way that makes life better for everyone. Can we at least agree on that? Yes, Silas said. Good. We end the killing so we can make life better for worshipping Tuareg. Here's a thought. Why don't I do most of the talking? As far as negotiations between warring parties went, the trappings were sparse, but functional. Another compromise. It was neither the opulent finery that the high lords of Kel were used to, nor was it the dingy griminess that those fated to be slaves were forced to live in. Silas and his two companions sat in simple wooden seats at one end of a long table that had been placed in the central hall of the temple. Their guards were allowed to wait at the periphery of the room. Once they were settled, the other contingent arrived. Guards wearing gleaming armor bearing the royal seal of Kel marched in, a stark contrast to the rebellion's makeshift weaponry scavenged from the corpses of the dead. Next came Rex's two advisors. The first was a human wearing opulent robes of red and silver. Enough gold hung from his neck to purchase all of the former slaves on Silas's side of the room at least twice over. That's Barnabas Cycalian, Gideon whispered to his two fellows. He's one of the richest men in Kel, owns the entire dock quarter. His family has been here since the very beginning, and he's got his fingers in just about everything. They say he gets first pick of any goods arriving in the... Unless his fingers are in Tuareg, then what does it matter? Silas muttered, before looking past the richly clad human. What the? Oh my, Gideon replied, at the sight of the next advisor. This is a surprise. A rugged-looking dwarf had entered the room. His salt-and-peppered beard was adorned with jewels of every color imaginable, and he wore polished armor of the highest quality. Across his back lay a battle-axe that gleamed as if it were made of solid silver. Silas bolted from his chair. But before he could take so much as a single step, Gideon put a hand on his shoulder and guided him back down. His name is Thuron Bangard. He owns a mithril mine about twenty leagues outside of town, buys a lot of slaves here, and hires scores of mercenaries, too. But he's usually not considered one of the High Lords, since he so seldom makes an appearance. Slug leaned over. What do you think the chances are that he was purposely brought in? Now in the banner we march under. Gideon glanced sidelong at Silas, noticing the awestruck look in the young paladin's eyes. Offhand, I'd say it's pretty high. However, if Silas was mesmerized by the stately image of the dwarf, it was undone by the grimace he made as the final member of the opposing contingent entered. Rex Telegar, High Lord Magistrate of Kel, was large even for an infernling. Nearly seven feet tall on his own, 
he added another several inches, thanks to the spiral of pitch-black horns which protruded from either side of his head, matching the color of his eyes. His skin was nearly ruby-red in color, which greatly accentuated his muscular frame. Indeed, he appeared far more a warrior than one accustomed to sitting upon a throne. Gideon turned towards Silas to make the final introduction, but then a look of pure horror crossed his face as he saw Silas's hand reaching back toward his quiver. "'What are you doing?' he hissed. "'What I was born to do,' Silas replied. His eyes locked on Rex's demonic visage. "'Did you forget what we talked about?' Silas glanced in his direction and shrugged. Er, uh, something about Tuareg? No, about infernlings and how they're just trying to do good and how they need to work all that much harder and... Oh, forget it. Sit still and don't kill him. But Tuareg doesn't want you to. How would you know that? Silas asked, dubiously. Um, well, I had a vision of our lord last night. You did? Yep. He appeared right in front of me, told me to keep you from doing anything stupid today. Oh, well, that's different then. Silas relaxed in his chair. Tuareg's will be done. Gideon shook his head and muttered, We are so doomed. In the eyes of Tuareg we all are. If the other side heard their exchange, they gave it no heed. The three took their places at the opposite end of the table. Barnabas and Thuron took their seats, but Rex remained standing, his imposing figure casting a long shadow. "'Welcome, my friends,' he said in a smooth voice that belied his frame. "'Dark times have recently fallen upon Kel, and our streets threaten to run red with blood. People have been displaced from their homes, and—' He paused to glance at his surroundings. "'Their places of worship as well. Nevertheless—' I can't help but feel this was inevitable. Rex placed his muscled arms behind his back and took a deep breath. Times are changing within the kingdom, and perhaps this is a sign that we should change too. Kel has prospered for many years, but maybe those of us sitting on high have grown too fat off the labors of others. He leaned down and stared at the men across from him, his tone serious. I am well aware there have been uprisings in the past, and I can't help but think that, even if we were to put this one down, we shall simply find ourselves seated at this table another day, the cycle repeating itself, rather than heed the advice of my council or the actions of my forefathers. I think perhaps I would like to break this chain now so that my sons will spread forth and tarnish the land with their devilry. Silas replied, accusingly, "'Excuse me.' Gideon practically sprang out of his chair. "'Deepest apologies, Lord Telegar. My colleague here is brave of heart and sure of soul, but he suffers from an accident incurred from his time in the mines. A rock fell on his head, so now he constantly blurts out nonsense.' "'He does?' "'I do?' Silas asked. "'Yes, you do.' Gideon replied through gritted teeth. Now, kindly remember what we talked about and mind your tongue. Tuareg commands it. Silas spared a narrow-eyed glare at Rex, but then did as told. Slug looked as if he wanted to comment, but Gideon was quick to add, As you were saying, my lord? Rex raised one black eyebrow. An interesting affliction. Perhaps the blessed healers of Loradain can assist in mending him back to health. Oh, no. Gideon gasped. However, before Silas could say anything on the matter, Rex held up a hand. Merely a joke, I assure you. I am well aware of the insurgency's fondness for the god Tuareg. In fact, I wish to know more of his tenants, so I asked my friend Thuron here to the table, so that he might offer some insight. You see, I've always considered myself more a scholar than a theologian, alchemy, history, the sorts of things that are more tangible to the— Greetings, Brother Dwarf, Silas interrupted, his gaze once more sat upon Thuron. The dwarf merely scoffed. I think you have me confused with someone about two feet taller, boy. All of my brothers are squat, bearded, 
and can drink their body weight in ale. Chuckles were shared on that side of the table, but Silas remained serious. My apologies. I only meant that it's an honor to address another humble servant of Tuareg, even if I could never aspire to call an honored individual such as yourself brother. Theron looked up at Rex, as if seeking permission to continue. The leader of Kel nodded and took his seat, ceding the floor to the dwarf. See, that's what had me confused when Lord Delagar's messenger hawk reached me, said that there was an uprising being led by Tuareg worshippers, but that they were mostly human, had me scratching my head for the better part of a week. After all, most priests of the Keln are from up north, and those that bother coming down this way are usually too busy battling monsters or hiring themselves out as mercs to do much more. There's a few who work for me, sure, but so far as I'm aware, the only humans who show any interest in this great lordship are usually those hoping a free pint of dwarven brew gets passed their way. Interesting, Rex said. What say you, Barnabas? Most sailors who come through my port are disciples of Nala, the sea goddess. And that said, throwing the occasional sacrifice to the wet witch isn't unheard of either. Sailors like to hedge their bets when they're far from port. Never heard of any of them praying to Tuareg, though. Theron nodded. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, there's those shattered hammer lunatics, but as far as I know, they mostly keep to themselves. Good thing, too, because I'm not sure what I'd do first. Spit in their faces or split their heads with my axe? Silas immediately perked up. Ah, oh, you've heard of my home. Not a day goes by where I don't miss the back-breaking labor or the spittle rained down upon me by the holy dwarves within. Excuse me. You say you're actually from the shrine of the shattered hammer? Of course. I was raised there and taught the true path of Tuareg. Theron banged a gauntleted fist upon the table. The only truth there is that coin copper beard as a sack of goat shit. All of those bastards are nothing but cum stains splattered upon the backside of the world. Silas smiled. Yes, you do understand, for we are all crusty streaks dirtying the holy loincloth of Tuareg. You're not listening, boy. All those maniacs do is... Rex held up a hand, and the dwarf immediately ceased talking. Fascinating. Perhaps when next we take a break, dear Thuron, you can enlighten me further as to this shrine and their teachings. I have a feeling it will be insightful to know. But for now, we should get back to the matter at hand. Tuareg is the matter at hand, Silas boomed. Gideon again put a hand on his shoulder. I think he means discussing peace. Of course, peace through the everlasting torment that Tuareg brings. No, a cessation of hostilities here in Kel. Pointless if you ask me, Slug grumbled. Hostilities seem to be working just fine so far. I can see that your friends are men of action, Rex said, addressing Gideon. Gideon, in turn, chuckled nervously. That's one way of putting it. Well, then perhaps we might be best served by actions rather than words. The former chief slave gulped audibly. Actions? As in? As in putting our cards on the table so that we can actually work toward a solution. Rex stood up again, causing Silas to visibly tense. Peace, my friend. Though I address you from a position of power, I know that I am highly motivated to negotiate. For you see, I am lord of this city. But it is a position I do not take lightly. When my city is in pain, I am in pain. I only wish to put a salve upon the wounds. So I will come out right and ask, What grievances shall we address so that we might... Hope to begin the healing process. The only hope is in the worship of Tuam. Gideon clamped a hand over Silas's mouth, 
then quickly said, What my friend here means is that being a slave is to live a life with no hope, and to have no hope drives men to desperate measures. So long as this cycle continues, the wounds will continue to fester no matter how many bandages you apply. Rex nodded. Wisely said, my friend. I am forced to agree. So what would you have us do? Burn this city to the ground as a show of... Gideon pointed a finger at Slug's face. Don't start. He then gave Silas another warning look before turning to face Rex again. I've heard news that slavery is on the wane in the kingdom. More and more cities are outlawing it. Indeed, the capital itself has had a ban on such practices for decades now. As you said, times are changing. Kel needs to change with them. You know an awful lot about the goings-on in the kingdom for a house slave, Barnabas replied. At this, Gideon's tone became slightly guarded. My former master would receive visitors from far and wide. I learned of such things from them. So you spied on him? Of course not. I was simply in attendance. I merely kept my ears open. Rex held up a hand before Barnabas could say anything further. So far as I am aware, Lord Cycalian, hearing and seeing aren't crimes. Should one care not to be overheard, then one should be smart enough to hold a meeting in private, away from the ears of others. He gestured toward Gideon, reading between the lines, I assume you are talking about abolishing slavery in Kiln, yes? A fair assumption. You are, of course, aware of the economic and social upheaval that would occur if I were to do that, correct? Businesses would fail, established houses would collapse, and many of the former slaves would starve on the streets before a new economy could be properly established. One could argue that the aftermath would not be so different than the insurrection we now face. Freedom would be achieved, but at what cost? Merchants aren't stupid, Barnabas added. Their ships are made of wood, and you don't put wood anywhere near where there's a fire, whether real or metaphorical. Even ignoring the slavers, the rest would gladly sail south for a few extra days than put in to port at a city on the verge of collapse. We're talking lives here, Slug slammed his fist onto the table. Not jams or gold pieces. If Rex was bothered by his outburst, he didn't show it. Gold equates to a standard of living that affects lives. This isn't a farming town. We live or die by our trade. Without gold, you can't buy bread for your family, healing potions for your sick children, a roof over your head. Slaves don't earn gold. That's only for the masters. The masters who pay for your bread, healing, and that roof you're living under, Barnabas shot back. They pay as little as they can to get away with to keep us alive. Our existence is one of torture. And I thank Tuareg for it every day, Silas cried out, causing the conversation to cease and all eyes in the room to turn toward him. Thoron ran a hand through his beard and sighed. Boy, did you perchance land on your head as a child? The monks of the shrine dropped me repeatedly. They said it was Tuareg's will. Why do I not find that surprising? Barnabas muttered. The dwarf nodded his agreement. You're a few points short of a keg. I hope you realize that. Gentlemen, please, Rex said, his gaze falling on everyone at the table in turn. Finally, he addressed Slug. I understand what you are saying, and I believe we can come to a compromise. A compromise? Gideon stood up and held a hand to his colleague. Please... "'Tell us what you have in mind, Lord Telegar. "'So that's how it is, eh?' Slug replied to him. "'Or oh, talk about suffering, and you just can't wait to dismiss me and kiss his ass. "'Once a house slave, always a house slave. Oh, "'I swear you're like a leashed kobold. "'I'm trying to keep us from killing each other. "'An offer on the table is better than a city full of slit throats. 
Maybe if you occasionally used that head of yours for thinking, you'd see that. Slug turned to Silas. What say you? Do we listen to this shit, or shall we take our lives into our own hands? Silas appeared to consider this. After several tense seconds, he gestured toward Gideon. A vision from Tuareg is not to be ignored. What? Slug cried. Don't tell me you actually bought that pile of orc shit. He's lying, because he knows that's the only way you'll sit there and keep your holes shut. Silas raised an eyebrow and turned toward Gideon. Did you really see Tuareg? Why, yes, of course I did. Good enough for me. Let us hear what that filthy demon has to say. Across the table, Rex Telegar blinked several times, his mouth agape, until he finally said, You really should get that head wound looked after. Nevertheless, I thank you for hearing me out. I offer this. Slavery cannot be eliminated within Kel on a mere whim. It would be disastrous for the city. Murmurs of assent were heard from his advisers. Such a thing must be done gradually. Wait, Barnabas interrupted. What are you saying? Exactly as you heard. Now be silent and allow me to finish. I propose the following. The purchase and sale of new slaves will be ended within a period of six months that will allow the houses and traitors to make good on any deals they already have in play. After that, all workers who are taken in will be free men to be paid for their services. And what of existing slaves? Gideon asked. A quarter of your forces, those with the most seniority, will be freed immediately. They will be free to stay or go, but if they stay, they will be paid a fair wage. I will create a special committee to ensure that the quality of life for remaining slaves is not ignored by their masters. Half of that committee will be made up of freedmen to ensure these reforms are carried out fairly. And the rest? I propose that slavery will be phased out over the course of the next three years. The duration will allow the established houses of Kell sufficient time to rework their myriad businesses to more agreeable trade. The noble houses won't like that, Barnabas said. I suspect they will like it much less if their homes are burnt to the ground and their families slaughtered like cattle. What say you, Thuron? I already pay plenty of my workers. What's a few more? Besides, I can always supplement my diggers with prisoners of war. There is always some scuffle or other going on. Rex nodded, then turned again toward the other end of the room. An offer is on the table, gentlemen. What say you? An offer, Slug replied. An offer to lay down our arms and be put back in chains? How generous of you. Not at all, Gideon argued. Think about it. You've been working those salt mines for years, Slug. You would be among those freed today. You could sit on that council Lord Telegar is proposing. That could be arranged, Rex replied in turn. Me, on a council? That's a joke, Slug snorted, then spat on the floor. And what of Silas? He's the reason we've made it this far. But you'd see him thrown back into the mines. Gideon nodded. True enough, but it won't be forever. Those in the mines don't last forever, and you know it. Personally, I found it to be invigorating, Silas said. Although I must admit to missing the hard labor of my youth. Twelve hours of digging seems almost too easy in comparison. Perhaps we can increase that when I get back down there. Daft idiot, Thuron muttered from across the table. Thank you for reminding me of my stupidity, friend dwarf, Silas replied. I will be sure to whip myself bloody and then throw my unworthy self on to the rock salt as penance for my forgetfulness. Well, Gideon replied, now that we're in agreement, before we continue, Silas said, turning to Rex, there is one other matter that I didn't hear addressed. And that would be, Mr. Kane, enforcing the love of Tuareg, of course. What? Gideon cried. I'm sorry, Lord Telegar, but... 
But we cannot accept any offer that ignores Tuareg, Silas continued. Surely you must understand this is a city of sin. Slaves, masters, none of that matters. The only true way to cleanse this wicked place is by donning the armored gauntlet of Tuareg's love and shoving it down the throats of every man, woman, and child. Then, and only then, can we truly be free. Silence descended on the room as everyone stared at Silas, a mix of confusion and outrage on their faces. Finally, Rex broke the impasse. Surely you must realize that would be a step backwards for our fine city. How could worshipping the god above all others be a step back? Are you a flippin' moron? Theron stood up and pounded on his side of the table. You shrine maniacs are a blight upon the land. I swear, if coin wasn't related to me on my wife's side, I would march my men up there and kill your master with my own hands. Alas, you are too late, for I did that myself. Wait, you killed Coin Copperbeard? Yes, Silas replied brightly. He was cavorting with demons, so I freed his soul. Praise Tuareg. What kind of bloody psychopath are you? Enough, Rex cried out. I'm sure you two can discuss the finer points of religion on another day. And it truly is a fine religion, Silas interrupted. The finest there is. I'm sure it's quite nice. But the truth of the matter is that both the citizens and slaves of Kel have enjoyed religious freedom for some time now. A blank look fell over Silas's face. Religious freedom? Yes, whether it be Loredane, the dueling gods, or your Tuareg, people are free to pray to whoever they like. Heresy, Silas muttered. Yes, even that is allowed. Rex continued, either not noticing or caring that Silas's face was beginning to turn beet red. All religions are welcome here, even the less desirable ones so long as they don't cause trouble. Why, there's even a small cult up in the higher quarter that's devoted to Asmodeus. Not my cup of tea, mind you, but they mostly keep to themselves, and... You allow devil worship here? Silas asked, his voice suddenly devoid of emotion. We don't actively encourage it, but yes. Regardless, that's not the point. What I'm trying to say is that all are free to die, filthy devil enabler. Before anyone could say anything to that, Silas had knocked his bow and let loose an arrow in Rex's direction. Communication Breakdown Gideon leapt from his chair, seemingly faster than was humanly possible. No! His voice seemed to boom across the temple. Indeed, a few candles actually flickered as the arrow shot by Silas sank into Rex's left arm. The royal guards immediately leapt to their lord's aid, pulling Rex back and stepping in front of him before Silas could let another arrow fly. On the other side of the table, the shock of what just happened was only now settling in. "'What have you done?' Gideon hissed. "'Tuareg's will!' Silas replied with a smile. "'That wasn't Tuareg's will, you fucking piece of garbage!' Theron snarled, drawing his axe. "'You think he could ever love you for the things you've done in his name? Your kind are filth, a disease upon this world.' "'Thank you, friend dwarf,' Silas called back. "'I am that and less.' "'Get out of my way!' Rex roared from behind his guards. He shoved a few to the side so that he could face the paladin again. I offered you peace, freedom, and this is how you repay me. Who cares about freeing our bodies when you're trying to enslave our souls? Are you serious? Slug asked, but he was drowned out by the Lord of Kel. So be it. You think I'm a devil? Then perhaps it's time for you to feel my wrath, unholy or not. He stepped back and motioned to his guards, kill them all. Rex and his entourage were led from the temple of the dueling gods, 
as his guards pushed forward, weapons drawn. Across the way, a much less disciplined group of slaves likewise drew their weapons and prepared to defend themselves against the far better equipped forces rapidly advancing upon them. A mix of emotions ranging from panic to determination sat on their faces, but of them all, only Silas seemed to be smiling. See? he said, shooting an arrow into the neck of one of Rex's guards. I told you he was evil. You're the one who shot first, Gideon screamed. True, but he threatened us with his unholy wrath. After you shot him, I failed to see your point. By then, several of the guards on their side had stepped into the fray, shouting somewhat less than enthusiastic cheers to Tuareg as they engaged their foes. A few encircled their leadership and began to steer Silas, Slug, and Gideon toward the exit. "'Go and tell the others there will be no peace,' Slug told one of their guards. "'Only victory or death.' "'Yes,' Silas cried. "'Tuareg smiles upon this day.' "'Are you crazy?' Gideon replied. "'Do you know how many men Rex has stationed right outside the gates? "'Gates which even now are probably being opened?' The only reason we've lasted as long as we have is because they've been reluctant to unleash their full fury onto the city. But then you had to go and try to kill the High Lord. Do you understand what this means? They're going to kill us all. Silas nodded, though the smile never left his face. Then Tuareg smiles upon us even more than I had hoped. The forces within the temple of the dueling gods were but a small fuse leading to a much bigger bomb, and the arrow Silas shot served as the fire that lit it. Within minutes, a battle cry rose up among the slaves, urging them to fight for freedom and for Tuareg. They were quicker to strike following the failed peace initiative, and the area around the temple was soon overrun, giving the slaves a false sense of impending victory. It didn't last. Before long, the bulk of Rex's forces, bolstered by reinforcements from the kingdom and mercenaries brought by Thuron, had mobilized and begun to push back against the ragtag slave rebellion. Neither mercy nor quarter was given on either side, as the fighting grew in intensity. Where before there was some reluctance from the city's defenders, now there was none. The warriors on the side of the rebellion quickly realized this and were forced to adjust their tactics on the fly. Over the next several hours, some of the inhabitants of the war-stricken zones managed to flee the city, but many more were caught in the middle as the two sides clashed, first in the streets and then eventually from house to house. Using guerrilla tactics, The former slaves were able to negate the size advantage the city's defenders employed, the narrow streets and alleyways serving as choke points in the struggle. For a time, it appeared as if a stalemate was likely. But then, near the end of the day, just as it seemed that the forces on both sides were deadlocked, Rex unleashed his secret weapons. From the east, catapults rained stones on the territories held by the rebels, while from the west the staff and students of the city's mage academy were conscripted into the city's forces. Fire and lightning soon joined the barrage against the insurrection. For a man who had claimed to love his city, Rex Telegar seemed intent on destroying it, rather than seeing it fall into the hands of usurpers. Or perhaps he was simply that incensed at the single shot fired at him just when it seemed peace was at hand. There is no telling, for as the battle progressed and the rebels were forced ever back, there came no word from the High Lord's manor. No offers were made, either to reopen Tonks or allow the former slaves the opportunity to surrender. It wasn't long before the air was filled with the screams of the dying as the city was blown to rubble around them. Silas held the dying man's hand, his body rapidly being consumed by the acid bolt which had struck him. Come on, my friend. You can do it. Thank you. Yes? Tuareg. Grub shit let out one final wheeze, and then was gone, dissolving into a viscous puddle of goo reminiscent of his name. 
If his death bothered the paladin, he didn't show it. Yes, Silas shouted gleefully. Oh, glory to Tuareg! I don't see what there is to be thankful for, Slug said, pushing his way past a mound of rubble. We're being torn to pieces out here. I know, it's glorious. Are you a fucking... Silas held up a hand as a whistling sound came from overhead. They looked up to see a massive fireball falling from the sky, headed toward a group of rebel warriors who had been taking shelter in the doorway of a partially destroyed manor. One of the fighters glanced skyward and saw it coming. He quickly cried out, Thank you, Tuareg! The others followed suit a moment later, just before they were blown into charred chunks. Praise Tuareg! Silas shouted with a raised fist, before turning back towards Slug. What were you saying? Have you gone fucking insane? Those men are dead. And for what? They died for Tuareg. What other purpose is there? Those people believed in you. I believed in you. Silas stopped and looked genuinely perplexed by this. Why would anyone believe in me? I begin to ask myself the same question, Slug replied. Look at where you've led us. Isn't this what you wanted? I wanted us to live, not be utterly destroyed. But during the meeting you kept calling for war. That was just posturing. Gideon and I discussed it ahead of time. We didn't want Rex to think we were too desperate to compromise. Ah, I see. Personally, I was never desperate, for my faith lies with Tuareg. That's why we didn't tell you. Silas looked around as more and more spells fell in the area, blasting former stately homes to piles of crushed stone. Where is Gideon anyway? Slug shook his head. I don't know. He might be dead already. I hope he had the good graces to thank Tuareg before he died. That's what you care about. I can think of nothing else. Tuareg's will be done. Slug balled his fists. So, back there... In the meeting with Rex, when you said none of us mattered, that you just cared about your stupid god, that was true? Of course. Silas turned away, a smile on his face as more screams thanking Tuareg rose in the night before being silenced forever. We are but pathetic sacks of flesh, sent here to do little more than rot our lives away. But Tuareg is eternal. To him, we should give all the glory so that when we die, we might be shit back out upon this world to fail him again and again. Slug tackled Silas from behind and shoved him to the ground. Enough. Thank you, Twa. A kick in the mouth interrupted the paladin. I said, shut up. All of this is your fault. You started it. We thought you wanted freedom, but all you wanted was to drag people down to whatever hell your maniac god inhabits. He grabbed hold of Silas, dragged him to his feet, then threw him into the side of a crumbling wall. I'm going to do what I should have done when you first stepped foot into my damned mine. Slug stepped in and planted a fist to the side of Silas's head, dropping the paladin to his knees. Silas tried to get up, but Slug grabbed a hunk of rubble and slammed it into his back, driving him down to the ground. Thank no more. He kicked Silas, then did it again, continuing to pummel the other man, not letting up for a second. However, the more he attacked Silas, the broader the paladin's grin became. You think this is a joke? Slug drew his sword. But before he could bring it down across Silas's neck, the paladin rolled, taking him out at the knees. Everything is a joke to Tuor. A nearby explosion shook the ground the roar of sound cutting off whatever Silas had to say. Before he could start in again, one of Slug's boots filled his mouth, sending teeth flying and knocking him onto his back. Slug scrambled atop Silas before he could get up and wrapped his hands around his former commander's throat. He increased the pressure, squeezing until he cut off the paladin's air. "'Now more Tuareg!' he screamed. "'Do you hear me? Now more!' Not now, not ever again. Your god is dead, and so are you. Fuck you, and fuck to all... Ugh! A bolt of lightning slammed into the building next to where the two men struggled, exploding it with eldritch energy, and sending tons of debris flying everywhere. A wave of dust and smoke washed over the area, 
obscuring it and everyone inside. When at last it cleared, Silas sat up, coughed, and then looked around to find himself alone. After a few minutes, his eyes came to rest upon a pile of rubble that appeared to be stained red with blood. Silas pulled himself to his feet and stumbled over as yet more dying cries thanking Tuareg rent the air around him, albeit they were becoming fewer and farther between. He bent down to examine the debris and saw one of Slug's tattooed hands protruding from beneath the pile, unmoving save for the occasional twitch. There came another whistle from overhead, followed by an explosion close by. Rex's forces appeared to be increasing their assault. Silas ignored it all, kneeling and placing one of his hands upon Slug's. Despite your anger, in the end, Tuareg's name was the last thing to leave your lips. Well done, my friend. May your suffering at his hands be eternal. Smiling, he rose back to his feet and began making his way through the burning street, cheering as ever more men were cut down while screaming Tuareg's name. Finally, the marching of boots caught his ear, and he turned and saw, through the dust and smoke, a large contingent of soldiers heading his way. "'Their defenses are broken!' one of them shouted. "'Take no prisoners!' Silas laughed and raised his hands to the sky. "'And now comes my turn. Thank you, mighty Twa—' A fireball exploded almost directly in front of where he stood, cutting him off and sending him flying through the air. The smile never leaving his lips, Silas's body smashed through the doorway of a nearby home. The shockwave from the blast hit the structure a moment later, collapsing it atop his battered form and burying him in darkness. Fractured Divinity I watched the so-called paladin begin to stir, wondering if I'd been a fool to save him. But I couldn't help it. I had to know why he'd done what he had, even if I already knew that I was lost for the part I played in all of this. So much death and destruction in such a short time. But even with all of that, there was still a chance. If the boy had learned anything from the horrors he'd played a part in unleashing, then perhaps he wasn't beyond redemption which meant that maybe I wasn't either. It was all I had left. Silas's eyes opened. He blinked several times and then coughed, the smoke still thick in the air despite the distance we'd traveled. Finally, he sat up. G Gideon? I'm here. What happened? What happened? Look! I pointed toward the city from our place on the hilltop, where I'd brought him. Though Kel was almost a mile distant, it was easily seen from the fires that continued to burn throughout. This, this is all you're doing. Silas coughed again, then pulled himself to his feet and stared at the dying city with me. I meant I wanted to know how pathetically I died and whether or not Tuareg enjoyed watching me suffer. What? You're not dead, you blithering fool. No. He sounded almost disappointed. Ah, uh, I see. You're a ghost sent by Tuareg to haunt me for my... I'm not dead either. I pulled you out of that hell so you could see what you'd done. He appeared to mull this over. In that case, I thank you. It would appear I've done Kel a great service. Good riddance, for it was a blight upon Tuareg's name. Are you kidding me? Do you know how many people died because of you? Rex ordered the entire slave population purged down to the last man. Silas nodded, making me hope that perhaps he had finally begun to understand the error of his ways. But then he said, See, I told you he was a demon. Him? He only did this because you shot him while he was offering peace. Maybe, but if he had been truly penitent before the eyes of Tuareg, he would have let me kill him and end his demonic existence. That makes no fucking sense. Not to you. Not to me either. But to Tuareg it's all crystal clear. That's what matters. I don't know if you understand this or not. Probably not, since your head seems to be filled with dried horseshit, but your beliefs got hundreds, maybe thousands of people killed. 
Silas clapped me on the back and smiled. I know. It was all I could do not to wrap my hands around his idiot neck and strangle him right there. If you know, then why do you look so happy? Because I accomplished my task. He turned to me and pointed at the scorched hammer carved into his armor. You see, I was sent to Kel by a servant of Tuareg himself. He told me to do what I could to end the suffering of the slaves there. Yeah, but they are no longer suffering. They're all free. Best yet, they died screaming Tuareg's name. A more glorious end one could not hope for. Silas turned away from the horrific sight of Kel, grabbed his bow and quiver from where I'd left it on the ground, and started to walk away. Where are you going? My work here is done, for now anyway, he called back to me. But Tuareg never rests, which means I can't either. I see now what my true life's quest is, to continue what I started here. I shall not rest until all are freed, just as the people of Kel were. I involuntarily shuddered as I considered what that meant. Do you truly think they'll remember you as a hero there? I shouted after him. That they won't hang you the second you show your face again? He stopped and turned back. I'm no hero. Merely a wretched servant of my God. As for my face, I seek no credit for the service I do. He inclined his head as if considering this. If need be, I can always serve Tuareg just as well from behind a mask. In fact, maybe better, because then he wouldn't need to look down and see my disappointing visage. Tis a fine idea. I thank you, Gideon. May Tuareg continue to despise you as he does me. As Silas disappeared from my view, I dropped the glamour I'd adopted in Kel, changing from the slave known as Gideon back to Theoden Grimstrike. But adopting the visage of my true self didn't lift my heart. Even if Silas wasn't smart enough to know what he'd done, I was. My failure was legion. In seeking to do good, to spare one boy who I thought might be worthy of redemption, I had paved the way for atrocities which I could never make amends for. I had unleashed upon this world a monster in the guise of a servant to the god I'd sworn to never bring shame to. Perhaps worst of all, his claim to being a paladin in Toreg's name was my fault, for I had opened up the pathway to my lord's divine power, allowing Silas to draw upon that godly energy, despite his unworthiness. In seeking to serve my lord, I had somehow created the very worst of devils instead. I could have followed him and struck him down, like some avenging arrow of the gods, but the damage he'd caused wouldn't be undone, and killing him now wouldn't erase the part I had played in it, all because I had defied my lord's decree and involved myself in the affairs of mortals, arrogantly presuming I could make things better. In that moment, the constant thunder that I heard from the mountain of storm strike fell silent, and I realized what I had to do. Tuareg was turning his back on me, as he rightfully should have, but the rest fell upon my lap. There and then, I renounced my divinity, purging myself of the divine essence that flowed through my veins, and becoming fully mortal once more. I was no longer worthy to call myself a god. All of this I write to you now as a simple friar, living alone and awaiting my death as the years catch up to me. Every day I pray for forgiveness, and every night I drink myself into a stupor, knowing it will never come because I cannot forgive myself. Still, I have some small hope that my humble life of penance has helped balance the scales of the heavens, perhaps enough for the gods to have found a way to contain the scourge of Silas Cain, assuming the imbecile is still out there, and hasn't succumbed to a well-deserved death. But that is not for me to decide. For now, all I can do is conclude my tale and hope it serves as a warning to others after my passing. This world is a marvelous place, full of mysteries and adventure. Keep your mind open to the possibilities of the wonder around you, and try to live your life the best you can. That is the true path to salvation. 
but above all else, should you ever meet a stranger on the road calling himself Silas Kane, run the fuck away as fast as your legs will carry you before he can even open his mouth and utter the word Tuareg. Trust me on this one. Epilogue That's it? Mike asked. That's the most fucking awful thing I've ever heard. Trevor pushed himself back from the monitor and sighed. A new epic of Gilgamesh, it is definitely not. Fuck no. That was just depressing as all hell. It's not like there was even a dragon or cool shit like that. Just a fucked up warrior obsessed with some god. Oh, and I'm still pretty certain it's actually pronounced Tor... I spent days working on this giant pile of crap and that's what you're hung up on? Mike nodded. Sorry, you're right. Who cares how any of it is pronounced? I mean, it's a god-awful story about a god-awful person. More like Tuareg-awful person. Mike opened a desk drawer and pulled out a bottle of bourbon and two glasses. Drink? After that, shit yeah. The archaeologist poured himself and his colleague a shot, then thought about it for a second and made it a double. You thinking what I'm thinking? Trevor asked, looking down at the brown liquid. We tell the director the scrolls were too degraded to translate. Then we shove this shit back in the archives and forget we ever saw it. You got it. It'll definitely be better for our careers than introducing the world to Silas Kane. Hell yeah. Fuck Dwarag. Right in his ass. They clinked glasses and took the first of what would be several long drinks. This has been... The Silas Kane Scrolls, Authors and Dragons Origins, Book 2, written by Rick Gualtieri, Authors and Dragons, narrated by Matt Haynes, copyright 2018 by Rick Gualtieri, production copyright 2018 by Rick Gualtieri.